Craig joined Ayers and Associates, a civil engineering firm, as an environmental planner in 2002, where his responsibilities as a project manager included working with unsewered communities, lakeshore communities, and governmental jurisdictions with planning and organized projects to provide cost-effective and sustainable wastewater treatment solutions in rural areas. He has served as the NEHA, don't know what that means. NEHA. Thank you. I can pronounce that, but I don't know what it stands for. National Section Chair. Okay, and NOWRA, board member. MOWA, conference committee co chair. He's a former MEHA, it's got to be health something, yeah. board member and president of Environmental Health Sanitarian of the Year. He earned a BS degree in environmental studies from Bemidji State and started the environmental health program for Cass County Environmental Services, where he worked for 18 years. You guys, we're blessed with two pretty professional people here, and we're really happy they made the uh, distinction to come to Itasca County to do this seminar. Thanks. I'm going to do just the very same thing, and I'm really going to thank the organization for getting you all here. Because Craig and I can talk. You'll figure that out by the end of this. We're good talkers, but I can't get anyone to sit in these chairs, and they got you all here. So um, we really appreciate them sponsoring this event um, and having a pot luck and all of that. Uh, so we're going to talk about water. But, and you think you're here to talk about septics and well, but the reason why we're here to talk about septics and well is all about protecting our water. So, um, if you have a cell phone with you today, can you please just silence it? And if you need to take a call, please walk outside of the room. That would be appreciated. So, what we're going to talk about today, and this first one isn't on a lot of our radar screens, and that is what are chemicals of emerging concern. The reason why we're talking about this is twofold. One, it's something you are going to hear more about. And two, the way that Craig and I got here tonight was because we got a grant from the Minnesota Department of Health to talk about chemicals and emerging concern and how they relate to septics and wells. So that'll be a little part. And the good news about chemicals of emerging concern is if we have a good well and we have a good septic, the issue is a lot, a lot less significant than most of us. So with that, then we're going to focus on first, I'm going to spend time talking about what is a good septic system. Then Craig's going to talk about what is a good well and drinking water system and how you manage that. And then we'll come back and talk about septic system maintenance. So during my first talk, you're going to want to talk about tank pumping because we all saw that beautiful pump truck outside. But we're going to hold that till the end and save the best for last. So the first topic again is chemicals of emerging concern. So if you just look at this picture, it kind of sums up what we're talking about. That there are more and more products that we are putting down the drain that we are finding in our waters, whether it be our drinking water or our lakes, rivers, and streams. So you might ask yourself, well, why? Well, one is because we're using them all, right? These are chemicals, things, even like next time you're shampooing your hair, just turn over the bottle and look at the ingredients. Most of it, if you're buying it at a commercial store, has a bunch of ingredients that I can't pronounce. And so when those things go down the drain, many of them are getting out into the environment, either through our wastewater treatment plant or potentially through our septic systems. So what does this term mean? So I'm going to start calling them CECs, because chemicals of emerging concern is a mouthful. Um, but we all know what a contaminant is, right? A contaminant really, though, is something that's somewhere that it shouldn't be. And CECs are substances that have been released to, found in, or have the potential of entering Minnesota's waters. And our ground and surface water, the key thing to understand is they're connected. The, thing, the, the water that we're putting into the ground for our septic system, for many of us, is either going to reach a lake river stream, and in some situations may be reaching groundwater. So these new things we're concerned about, the reason why we're concerned is with some of them, we don't yet know at what level they're safe. So I'll give you the example. The most commonly found CEC that we've actually found in drinking water is atrazine. And if I asked you how much atrazine do you want in your drinking water, what would you say? Zero. Right, zero. Okay, just remember that in a second, right? So, but when it comes down to it, we have a limit of atrazine that is safe that we know very likely will cause you cancer and will cause you to die. But we don't know, science doesn't know, but what if I give you a little bit of atrazine every single day? That's not how we test things. We test at what level it kills rats. 
And someone smarter than me takes that information and relates that to humans. We don't take that same chemical, and atrazine is just one of thousands of these, of these chemicals, and say, well, what if I give the rat a tiny bit every day? Does it change its life expectancy? Companies don't do that sort of testing. So now we're thinking about things like that that we didn't think about before. So they either pose a real threat that we understand that they actually are causing problems, particularly to aquatic species, or they have a perceived health threat. And then it could be that we have new or changing exposure information. We are starting to gather more information. So you see the things that are included in this list, pharmaceuticals, pesticides, industrial effluents, personal care products. So a lot of these things are things that we are putting down the drain. So new contaminants are being found in Minnesota's waters. But going back to my example of atrazine, is atrazine a new chemical? No, it's been around for a while. So the kind of the question is, well, why are we finding atrazine now and we didn't find it before? Well, in this case, it's because there are better methods. We can now, and again, this may not mean a lot to some of us, but we, we typically measure things in parts per million. But now we're measuring things in parts per trillion. So it may be that the level of atrazine that they found in someone's water might be 0. 0.00004. But when I asked you how much you wanted, you didn't say you wanted 0.0004, right? You said you wanted zero. But sometimes that's not the reality of the water that we have. It has some contaminants in it. And then the question is, well, is that a problem? So you see we have new substances we're looking for, new substances being added all the time, right? Think about the aisle when you go to your local hardware store or your convenience store, right? There used to be a couple soaps, now there's Right? Hundreds of soaps to pick from. And then we have old substances we're using in new ways. So again, these are some of the more common things that may be coming down the drain at your house that are getting into our water. And so then the question we have to ask ourselves is, well, is this getting into our lake rivers and streams, and as it, is it getting into our drinking water? The good news is there's more and more research on septic systems that actually show the soil removes most of these. Wastewater treatment plants don't have the same benefit. They don't have the same retention time, so there's actually very likely if you're dumping your wastewater treatment plant directly into a lake river stream, down the road they might have to do additional treatment for some of these new chemicals. So in this picture, we're going to transition into what is a good substance. And what I want to highlight in this picture, and it's probably hard for some of you in this big room with all these great people, is that you'll see underneath the septic system, you see that CECs are being degraded and absorbed, meaning they kind of basically stick to the soil. So if we have a good septic system, the soil actually will be, for the most part, again, nothing's bulletproof. The other thing you'll see, though, again, is that when this water leaves the septic system, the reason why septic systems are so important to protecting our well, our wells is you'll see, right, I have a setback, it's not right by it, but that we need to be protecting our well. And in some cases, this down gradient source might be your lake. It doesn't always flow in this direction, but you have to understand one way or another, the effluent from your septic system is getting into Minnesota's water. Uh, soda you're drinking in front of you, the water, the coffee, right, it's all been used before. So what has it been used for? Well, my mind goes to the toilet, right? It's actually ironic that we use potable drinking water, clean water to flush our toilets, but we do. But think about the next time you flush, someone might want to drink that water. Not anytime soon, right? So that's really the question. When water comes out of your tap, was it used days ago, years ago? Some people would like to think maybe they're drinking dinosaur pee. But most of our groundwater isn't that old, right? It's not. So what is a good septic system? So here are some of the key things. One, it doesn't back up in your home. Well, that sounds really obvious to maybe all of us in this room, but I just had a friend of the family who got a new septic system who said, it's great, I can now do laundry without it backing up into my basement. I grew up with a system that backed up into our basement, that's how we knew when to get the tank pumped, right? It was full, or I don't, you know, this was before I knew everything that I know now, right? So, um, it's not gonna surface into your yard or into a water body. 
So again, no spongy areas over your septic system. And there are still a good handful of systems that are actually considered to be imminent public health threats in our state where wastewater either directly comes to the surface or dumps into a lake, river, stream, ditch. They were typically more common in farming communities because there would be a tile running by and that tile would end up in a ditch. But there, there were even lakeshore homes where their easiest solution to get rid of the water, right, was to put it into the lake and people didn't think about the impacts that could cause. So the next one is if you, do you have a good septic tank? Is your tank watertight? So there's two problematic systems here, tanks. One are you could have had a good tank, but over the years it got damaged. So it has a crack in it. It has a way for not properly treated water to exit that. The second type were actually tanks. They really weren't called septic tanks. They were called cesspools or dry wells. That were tanks that were designed to leak from the minute they went in. And they were put in as commonly as the early 80s was the last time I know of any that were put in but there's still a lot of them out there. So if you ever hear cesspool or dry well, they just don't have adequate treatment. That's the bottom line. The last one is the one that's probably the hardest to understand, but probably the most important. And that is when you put the wastewater into the soil, does it have time to be treated before it hits a water table? And that isn't necessarily a standing water table. Our water tables fluctuate, but the amazing thing is the soil keeps track of the water table. It keeps track of, has that soil been wet for extended periods of time? Because if that soil is wet, we're not going to get treatment. <coughs> so when they go out to evaluate existing systems, this is what they look at. They don't actually look at, is it big enough for the house? That's like bonus, right? They may tell you something like that. They're looking, is it protecting public health and the environment? And these are the criteria that they use. So here again, what does it look like in someone's backyard? And this may not be your backyard, because this is the backyard everybody wants because it's gravity. Right? It goes gravity out of their basement to their septic tank, gravity to a drain field that, they, that is below the ground, which is, you know, and I've, I've learned that many homeowners think that pump is a four-letter word, and it is. But again, so some systems need pumps because they don't have this going for them. Or again, if you have a mound system, mound systems need to have pumps. But the good thing is we all have wells that have pumps too, right? Pumps last a long time. And by la a long time, I mean 10 to 15 years is pretty typical. Yep, it will need to be replaced. But the great thing is your septic pump has an alarm. So if it doesn't work, it's going to tell you that it's not working, as opposed to your well pump that usually just stops, right, and you're out of water. So here's what we're talking about that three feet. So this property, again, um, had the soil conditions to actually, from the bottom of their system to their limiting condition. So I said saturated soil, because I'm guessing that is the limiting factor here. There are a few parts of Minnesota that have very high bedrock, so solid rock doesn't treat wastewater either. So those are your two kind of limiting conditions. So I also want to point out, kind of starting from the beginning, that you as the user of your septic system are part of the system. What you put down the drain matters. So at the end of this talk, we'll come back to talk about more things you can do in your home to protect our water and also protect your septic system. Most people aren't excited about spending, and it depends what kind of system, right? 10, 15 grand on a new system. So anything you can do to lengthen the life of that system, the better off we are. But I also do want to highlight they don't last forever. Like, how many of us have the refrigerator from 1974 in their house? <laughs> There's always somebody. Like, <laughs> 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 right? 1974. <laughs> so they're very rare. And my point is, yes, could someone's septic system be as old as me and still be working? Yes. But it might be time for a new model. My husband doesn't say that, though, so it's OK. <laughs> So right, then we're going to go from the house into a septic tank. Every system has a septic tank. They don't all look like this. Meaning you hear this is a pretty simple one, shows two manholes. We'll talk more about that. And then you're going to have some sort of soil treatment. There are other systems that, so what the septic tank does is it pre-treats the effluent before the soil. There are other pre-treatment systems that are more sophisticated. I mean, a septic tank is basically a settling anaerobic box. Well, there are systems where you can add air, you can add media. So those systems clean, 
clean the effluent before the soil a lot more than a septic tank. But guess what? They also are a lot more than a septic tank. Expensive. So there are properties that, one, may not be able to make a regular system fit. Or I've seen a few homeowners who really, really, really don't want a mound because it's in between their view of their house and the lake. And so they're willing to pay more to have not have that mound in their yard. So we're not going to talk about those tonight because it's this, this many systems in Minnesota. But if that's something you're interested about, we can talk about it um, at the end of class here today. So looking at what does the septic tank do, and the, it's very important the septic tank be working properly because it is pre-treating before the soil. So you can see the number one job of the septic tank is to catch solids. More than half of the solids that you put down the drain settle out or are digested in the septic tank. So you can see it's going to decompose organic solids and store things that are inorganic. Not everything we put down the drain is organic. And what I mean by that is, can the soil microbes actually break down the contaminant? So some of those we want to hold back in the septic tank. Then, when your septic tank is properly operating, it will have three layers. This is natural sedimentation, that the heavy stuff settles to the bottom, the light stuff floats to the top, and the cleaner effluent leaves the tank. Um, and the last part you'll see is there's anaerobic bacteria. So, Amazing microbes live in your septic tank and are actually continuing to digest, right? We start the digestion process, they continue that um, in the septic tank. And they are naturally occurring, right? They actually come from us. When you start flushing the toilet, you are putting anaerobic bacteria. So um, it is true though that if you leave, right, and I'm sure some of us in this room are seasonal, when you leave those microbes, if they're not fed, what, what are they going to do? Right? They eat what's there, might eat each other, and after that, they're going to die. So every time you kind of starve your system off, when you come back, even if it's for a vacation, and you start flushing the toilet, guess what happens? Oh yeah, they figure out there's food. We're going to repopulate this tank based on how much food is available. So here shows, again, a simple septic tank. There are tanks that have multiple compartments. Some of you may have two tanks in a row but they do all have some similar characteristics. So you see the effluent coming from the house? This is the first thing, is there something right when that, when that pipe comes in that's called a baffle. The purpose of that baffle on the way in is to make sure that the wastewater doesn't go like this quick, that it travels down. We want time for that wastewater to slowly kind of travel in the tank for the treatment and the settling to happen. You'll see there's one on the way out of the tank, which is important too, it's even more important because remember that scum layer that floats to the top? If you don't have a baffle on the way out, the scum layer goes out to your drain field. And oils and greases getting out to your drain field is bad. Whatever sort of soil treatment system you have. And so when they come out to clean your tank, they're also going to check, are your baffles there? Because guess what? They can fall off. And that would be a bad thing to not have baffles. So again, here's our sludge layer sitting on the bottom, our scum floating on the top. So a couple other things I want to point out. This one shows the manholes at grade. If you ha uh, have gotten a system put in since 2008, or thereabouts, depending upon when your county uh, adopted the new code, all new systems, the manholes are at grade. And you may, but you may have a system that isn't, which means when they come out, they're gonna have to actually dig and access that. We'll talk more about that with maintenance. Um, you'll also notice too, um, you'll see here in this case that we have two of them. Um, and you may, again, your tank may not have to. The reason why, again, we've gone to having a rise over the inlet and outlet is those are both locations that we might need to do service. So we might need to get in and clear a blockage at the inlet. And in this case, what you'll see over the outlet of this tank is an effluent screen, which I'm going to show you pictures of coming up. Not on older systems, but on many newer systems, there's actually a screening device on the way out of the tank that prevents any solids. So let's say you have a really bad habit of doing all your laundry on Saturday. And you send a lot of effluent at one time, you can actually stir up the sludge and scum. Well, if you have a screen on the way out, it'll say, uh-uh-uh, right? I'm not going to let those solids through. So it's just a protection device, but it also just keeps out. Even under normal use, we'll hold back more solids. Sarah? So here's a picture of those screens. When we have a screen, what do we have to do with that on a regular basis? Oh, yeah, see? Okay. <laughs> Usually it's coming, right? Um, so there's many different sorts of screens out on the market. 
Um, what I will tell you is the bigger the screen that you have, the longer between service visits and our service. So there are some people who are willing to clean the screen themselves. I know of homeowners who do it. I know of other homeowners who say, I'm not doing that. Like that is not in my weekend, you know, to-do list. So here again is pulling the screen out. And I do actually have pictures later showing actually, but it has to be cleaned. So how often it has to be cleaned, we'll talk about too, but it really relates highly to use, but they need to be cleaned more frequently than your septic tank needs to be cleaned. So they replace the outlet baffle and you have to have a riser to grade because you need to be able to access that year round. But the problem of it needing to be cleaned could happen in January when the ground is frozen, so we don't wanna to have to dig through frost to get to it. So here again shows an in-ground in system where I have the three feet measured from the bottom of my system. So why do I end up with a mound? Well, the bottom line is, is that if I have a higher saturated soil or limiting condition, I bring in sand to achieve the three feet of soil. So when they go out to do your soil observation, that's what they're looking for is where is that limiting condition? So if they find it at 18 inches or two feet or even three, I have to still get a system in the ground, right? So they may need to bring in however much sand. And why do we use sand? Because I can pick up sand from one spot to the other and move it around without it changing, right? Think if you, I, and again, we're getting into soil terminology, but you pick up a loam or a clay and you start moving it around, it doesn't go back in a nice pile the way you found it. So we use sand because we know it's, it's called structuralist, right? That I can pick up the sand and move it here and it'll operate just how it worked over here. So the last thing I'm going to talk about is how do septic systems actually treat the things we're really worried about. So if we're worried about protecting human health, we're worried about protecting our lakes, I sometimes hear people who think that municipal wastewater is the way to go. We should sewer the world, right? Which one we can, simply can't afford to do. We can't run a pipe everywhere. But I'll take that argument any day because the wastewater leaving a properly operating septic system is actually much cleaner than the wastewater leaving the wastewater treatment plant. So a wastewater treatment plant is allowed. And again, when we talk about these here in particular, the solids they're allowed to put out, it's not zero. What we put out into the, when it reaches groundwater, it's zero. So it's actually cleaner. That doesn't mean it's always practical on everybody's property. Unfortunately, I live in Minneapolis and I don't have a septic system. And it makes me sad some days, right? I always say to people, it's kind of like, let's say you, oh, and I, I shouldn't even go here. Ford and Chevy, I don't care, right? So I know people in this room really do. But I always say it would be like, you know, working at a Ford dealership and driving a Chevy. Like, they're still both good cars, but you kind of want to, um, you kind of want to drive what you sell, and that's how I feel about having a septic system. Someday, right, I can have a septic system. So, with that, we're going to talk about how Everybody septic systems... <laughs> we all have dreams. Even if they're real odd. <laughs> so, um, we're going to talk about how septic systems deal with all of this. I want to highlight one key thing about this picture, and that is all of our wastewater needs to be treated, including our laundry water. Some people think that stuff coming, that, so it's called gray water, sometimes referred to, um, that, you know, that can just run out in the lawn. And that sometimes happened when people got their first automatic washing machine. It was not easy to plumb in, so they just ran it out on the lawn. But there's a reason why we wash our clothes, right? They're dirty. And there's actually a fair amount of bacteria and soap. So it is important that all of our water be plumbed in to our septic system. So where are we treating these issues? And this again points out the issue. No matter what your drain field looks like down here, this wastewater plume is gonna travel away and someone's going to want to use that water. In this case, again, it shows a well, but that can also be your lake. So first, the number one reason why we treat wastewater is it makes people sick. So anytime you are sick, you are shedding those bacteria and viruses from your body, right, when you use the toilet. So the things you'll find in wastewater are viruses, bacteria, worms, and protozoa. So how these are treated is they do not, our guts are actually anaerobic. The septic is anaerobic, but our soil is aerobic. And those aerobic conditions in the soil do not promote those bacteria and viruses living. It actually kills them off. 
So they remove and, and or die off in the soil treatment in the soil as long as we have that three feet of soil. So moving on to solids, two types of solids. The organic solids are digested and undigested animal and vegetable material. There's also some present in some of our cleaners. If we put these solids right out into the environment, and if they ran directly into our lake, they will suck oxygen out of them. Because that organic matter, if it's out in the environment, will want oxygen to break it down. The terminology is biochemical oxygen demand. It's just a measure, again, of how much oxygen do the bacteria need to break down that organic material. So how we treat it is some of them are going to settle out in the septic tank and be removed when the tank is clean. If you put an effluent screen or filter, that can also limit the passage to the soil treatment. But the good news is, is any of these organic solids that do get out to the drain field or the mound are going to serve as a food source. So it's kind of like a picnic. You don't invite the ants, they just come. The same thing in the soil. When you start putting that wastewater out, the soil microbes are like, food, we're going to come and eat that. We're going to digest that. We're going to break that down. So there's also inorganic solids. So uh, you'll see minerals, metals, and salts. The other thing that is in this category could be lint. So I don't know if you guys know, but when you wash your clothes, right, particularly synthetic fibers, so a lot of the tech and fleece and all of that, when you uh, take the lint out of your washing machine or your, your dryer, the same amount is coming off in the washer. So for instance, Patagonia did a study where they took a load of their fleece jackets, and in one load there were 100,000 microfibers that went down the drain. So now, if any time you're doing laundry, you are putting some fibers. There's no doubt about it down the drain. The question is, are they all being caught in the septic tank? And unfortunately, we don't have research on this. Um, I feel pretty confident that some of them are making it out to the soil because they're tiny little fibers, and they're just going to want to float through that tank. But, and I've tried. We've been trying to get some research dollars to look at this, and sooner or later, I'll be successful. So the problem that these can cause is they're inert and not subject to decay. So if they do make it out to the soil, the soil will say to polyester, I don't know what to do with you, or spandex, or you name it, right? So if it gets to a water body, it can cause the water body to be cloudy. But what I'm worried about with septic systems is it can cause the soil pores to plug. And if you haven't heard this term of microfiber yet, you will. They're finding it in lakes, they're finding it in effluent from wastewater treatment plants, so we're going to talk more and more about a lot of fibers that are out in the environment and are they problems. That was one of the comments we had about one of our grants is because they found it in fish. They found synthetic fibers in fish and their comment was, well, is it hurting anybody? Well, it's kind of that thing that you don't really want to think you're eating fish with fibers in them, but you probably are. And we don't know if it's causing any health impacts. So it's, you know, to me though, you have to look at the issue to kind of understand it better. That's what we need to get towards. So, so some of these, again, we're hoping that most of them are stored in the septic tank. This is another spot where an effluent filter would certainly help hold more of these inorganic solids back. But they could be, and I believe they're one of the reasons why systems eventually fail. When a system that's 40 years old surfaces, it might be because we've actually plugged up the soil pores and not enough water can get through to the underlying soil. All right, so phosphorus. Phosphorus is the number one reason when you see a pond or a lake that's green, it's because of phosphorus. I do want to highlight that not all the phosphorus comes from septic systems. A lot of it comes from fertilizer, it comes from egg runoff, all kinds of sources, but whenever I get in that discussion with people, I want our septic systems to be removing their phosphorus. And the number one way we remove phosphorus is having three feet of soil. So it comes from us. We eat food that has phosphorus in it that we don't need. We are always going to excrete excess phosphorus. It's still in some cleaners. It was banned in laundry soap in the 70s, actually. But there's still some detergents, because it's a really cheap detergent that used phosphoric acid. So we want to cut back on that as much as possible. So I mentioned its impacts. How we treat it is, again, if we have a good septic system, um, and it, there's a whole complexity that we can get into about how phosphorus is removed. It either is absorbed or precipitates in the soil. Some soils have a better phosphorus removing capacity than others, particularly when we talk about longevity. 
But ultimately, if you have a modern septic system that isn't, and at, but as septic systems get older and older, particularly in very coarse sandy soils, their phosphorus removing capacity could be getting towards the limit of what that soil can remove. So the last uh, nutrient we're going to talk about is nitrogen. So nitrogen in the Midwest, where we all live, the number one concern is to our health. So we do, we as humans excrete quite a bit of nitrogen. It's again in our urine. We consume nitrogen we don't need. We pass it on, right? It's also in some cleaners. So I mentioned the biggest problem is, is if it gets into our wells at too high a level. A little bit of nitrogen in our water isn't a problem, but if you get over 10 milligrams per liter of nitrate, that water is not safe to consume. So we test our wells for that, and Craig will talk more about that coming up. So how do septic systems deal with nitrogen? Well, ultimately, it does depend on your system. Is that actually a mound system, because of the way it's designed, does a better job? Not amazing, it doesn't get it to zero. Um, so ultimately, there's two things to rely upon, regardless of what system you have. That's one reason why we have a setback from our well to our septic system, is actually to allow for some groundwater dilution. But there are systems, particularly bigger systems, when they put in like community cluster septic systems, where they actually have to look at nitrogen and may have to put in advanced treatment. Because we can get the nitrogen to very low levels. If you notice, I mentioned here weed and elbow growth. So our oceans, so all those states that border the ocean, their ocean, the growth of algae and weeds in the ocean isn't limited on phosphorus, it's limited on nitrogen. So there are states that are enacting nitrogen standards kind of the way we think about phosphorus. So it could be down the road, particularly in more sensitive areas, we may even on an individual level need to look at, at nitrogen. But we would also need to look at other sources of nitrogen in the environment. Septic systems are only one. So the last topic is chemicals. So what about all these chemicals we're putting down the drain? So these are cleaners, medicines, you know, over the counter, you name it, right? So in high amounts, they can harm your septic system. And the, the hard part is in, in small amounts, they don't. So what's the difference between a small amount and a large amount? Well, that sometimes is in the eye of the beholder and it depends on the chemical. So probably the best example I could give you would be bleach. So if you did one load a week of whites and you put a cup of bleach in, it's not that easy to kill off all the bacteria. If it were, you could just do that every week and color good, right? But let's say you have a pretty active household, you're doing laundry every day, and you use bleach in every load, you know, the color safe stuff. That amount could really negatively impact all the good bacteria we need in the septic tank and soil. So we'll talk more about this at the end, but the key issue with this is, is using really as little of these things as we need. And that's actually good for our septic system, but it's actually good for the environment no matter where we live. And it's, in most cases, better for our health, too. So the other thing that I want to mention is these chemicals have, and again, we would have to get into specifics to talk about which ones, but we have found problems, particularly with the aquatic food chain, that things that live in the water every single day are much more sensitive. They are sensitive at parts per trillion that they are seeing is issues. And you can just Google this and you'll find scientific articles where they found issues with species reproduction. And on top of it, they are finding some of these things in people's tap water. And this is municipal water. So people who are you know, not on private wells, on public wells, are finding some of the che these chemicals in their drinking water. So how we deal them with a septic tank is they are stored in the tank until they're pumped. But they can, again, potentially. And you can go out to a household and like the last one I went to that they thought they were having problems because something went on in their house was someone who's going through breast cancer treatment. So what about all the chemicals when something like that happens? Because the big difference is when you're in a city, there's a whole bunch of people using it at the same time, right? So if one person is doing this over here, well, the rest of these people aren't, so it gets diluted out. When you're a couple people living on a house, you don't have that benefit, so you can have issues. And it's really difficult. And when you get into something like chemo or heart medicine or dialysis, you name it, you really have to look at what's specifically going down the drain at that house and is it actually impacting the microbes. Antibiotics are another good example. So antibiotics, again, they're designed to kill bacteria. That's literally what they're designed to do. So high amounts of antibiotics were going into a system, it could potentially harm it. So with that, 
I'm going to hand it over to Craig, and he's going to talk about drinking water systems. And we'll come back to talk about maintenance at the end. The best, right? Mm -hmm. How's everybody doing? Good. Good. All right. I want to get it straight first of all. I am Lenny. What a, I, first of all, I got to get this thing out before I start. I always have this problem. What's that? Forward. Forward. Okay. And I get back. I'm living Sarah's dream. I have three septic systems. I have two wells. I have a screen on one of my septic tanks. Um, I have, I have, and I have a lake shore. I have a, I live on a lake. I live in, I live in Walker, a couple miles south of Walker, on Walker Bay. And we bought our house in 1984, and we had a seepage tank system. The last seepage tank ended 20 feet from the lake. Bad. Yeah, <laughs> probably how we got the house. <laughs> At least at that point in time. So we are on our third septic system, and you guys know Lakeshore lots aren't exactly big, they don't make them anymore. This is our last one that we have for our lot. Uh, the first winter that we were there, we um, started doing the laundry, we were doing the laundry downstairs, right? And finally in the winter, the ice started turning blue. And as Sarah pointed out before, too, the, the drain, our basement drain went right directly into the lake. So what I'm really going to talk about is drinking water systems <laughs> um, and systems, not just wells, okay? It's a whole system. What I'm going to talk to you about is what we do in the state health department at public water supplies, and then I want you to apply that to your private drinking water system. Basic stuff, okay? Nothing real high technical, but stuff that should be looked at at least once in a while. Again, we're here to help public health. We err on the side of public health. So keeping that in mind, and is your well more vulnerable than somebody else's? Should you do things more often? And I'll talk about that. So again, it's who manages the risks. In, in the United States, it's the federal government. Uh, it's the Clean Water Act, which is great. Hand it down to the primacy to the state, then to a city, and then it's to a, a restaurant or resort. These are all public wells. And then it comes down to the private owners. There's no federal requirements for well, private wells. Similar to private septic systems. There's no federal requirements. There are state requirements and constructions. There are county requirements and constructions. But it's up to you guys. You know, you, it basically gets put on you. There's help out there. And you can refer to us at the health department, Sarah at the university. I want to point out that all our printed information, and we both have wonderful websites. Uh, you can go into the health department's websites, and links are on almost every piece of paper that I that we brought. We put this one together because I didn't know there'd be such a wonderful turnout tonight. Uh, that also has our websites on the back, and Sarah will probably talk about a product thing on that one. If there's enough, we need to get more at some point. So again, but it comes down to you. So in Minnesota, again, I'm going to talk about briefly what we do in Minnesota. There's a, um, a thou there's public uh, drinking water systems. There's the municipal, like Grand Rapids. There's also the non-municipal that are be like a trailer park. These are community systems. And then we have non-community public water supplies. This place, the town hall, is a public water supply, but it's a non-community water supply. So, and I'll get into those. So public um, community systems are where we live. So again, cities and towns, towns like Grand Rapids, municipality, non-municipal like a mobile home park, housing and developments. Non-community wells and, and public water supplies. It's the unit that I work in is where people go. So they would be the schools, churches, offices. And then we have transients and non-transients, and we have different requirements with those. The transients, we're kind of going to look at that when we look at our private homeowners and and some of the things we should do. Again, common, you're common, familiar with that. We have about a thousand. This is the staff at MDH that does that. We do annual monitoring, uh, even more than annual monitoring at that. And then we have non-community supplies. When we say, you know, it's the same slide. This is actually a non-community public water supply well, right there in the parking lot for that strip mall within the city. 
So we have 7,000, we have about 7,000 of those in Minnesota, um, nine community public water supplies. As I said, at 7,000 as this. This, the well gets tested here annually, depending upon their results, and then it gets inspected. The drinking water system gets inspected, or a sanitary survey is conducted once every three years here. And here's the definition. A non-transient, 25 people over six months. A transient, which makes it a public well, is 25 people for at least 60 days. And then there's certain requirements with that testing. So again, we want to help reduce the public health risk. We want to help you reduce your risk. We want to do monitoring and testing, and we want to do inspection and maintenance of your system. Basic stuff. Okay? So in the public water, in the public community system, they will look, as you see, 118 different types of uh, chemicals and pesticides. And it gets customized basically on <coughs> testing results for a particular city. So they will look at certain things uh, if they show higher levels or if they know of an area that higher level of contaminants. In the not in the not community, what I'm going to talk about is what we look as far as monitoring goes for babies. Okay? Babies are our most vulnerable and, and elderly. So when you have a, a smaller system, these are the what we want to test for, okay? The bacteria, the nitrates, arsenic, lead, and manganese. And you always want to use a certified lab. Again, go to the state health department. We have all the certified labs. There it changes, so you, you have to check it out once in a while. But they're, they're throughout the state. And then, as I said, we're, we do inspections of the public water supplies. We do them once every three years. It's called sanitary uh, survey. You should do the same thing to your system, not every three years, again, depending upon the vulnerability of your system, the vulnerability of your well. Go out and look at your wellhead. Uh, and I'll, I'll go over the components that you should be looking for. Your distribution system, like a city distribution system, you have one in your house. You know, that you could have backflow in your house that could get into your system and you could be drinking that water. So again, basic stuff to look at. And then where is your well? What's outside your well? What's, the, what's your well? wellhead protection zone. Can you manage anything that's within a certain distance of your well? Can you get rid of it? You know, there's minimum standards, but you can go beyond the minimum standards if you have room. Sometimes with Lakeshore properties, there's not always that room. So what can I do? Again, monitoring testing and inspect your well. So the vulnerability of your well is your well shallow more vulnerable and has a better chance of contaminants getting into your, the water that you're going to drink. Is it in a basement or a pit? Sometimes seasonal systems will be in a basement or pit because they didn't want them to freeze. So again, not a good situation what's going to drain the pit. Picture if you have an older well, does it have full length grouting? Is there grouting on your well? Again, the vulnerability scale of that. If you have grouting, if you have a deep well, it's not, not as vulnerable as if you don't have these things. The local geography, is there areas where the water is just going to go fast through the soils or if you have um, bedrock possibly divisions within the bedrock. And then flooding is always a big one. Are you in an area that floods once in a while? Does your wellhead flood? So again, vulnerability, these wells are kind of vulnerable. As you'll see, somebody just lake water. A pit. So there's the wellhead in the pit. That's the drain for the pit, basically, that wellhead, that well casing. And then seasonal flooding. Again, are you going to be drinking that water right after that type of flood? So you want to test. So, so, so let's have the question. How many have tested their water recently? Yeah, that's a good not percentage. <laughs> yeah, recently, within the last five years. Oh, well, there we go. Well, that's a little bit better. So, again, as I said before, vulnerability and we err on public health side. So, we recommend, we state health department, that you test for bacteria annually. I don't. But I know my well, and I've never had any bad results. But I do know my well. Uh, nitrates, again, biannually, two to three years, depending upon what your results are. Arsenic, one time, have you had your well tested for arsenic? Have you had your well tested for lead? 
Have you had your well tested for manganese? So bacteria. Uh, what we test for is, uh, is uh, coliform. We test for total coliform. It, and we also test for fecal coliform. Coliform itself is not a bad bacteria. It's an indicator bacteria for us. It shows that there is a pathway into your drinking water system. So it could be something else. We, it's too expensive to test for uh, viruses, etc., or other parts of contaminants. So these tell us if you have a positive that something has the opportunity to get into your drinking water system. So has there been any recent plumbing done in your work? If you get a positive, has there been something done to your well? Has there been something to your drinking water system? Was there plumbing done within the water system? Did the plumber wash his hands? Did you wash your hands? Did something get in there? Do you have dead end pipes in your system that maybe is harboring itself? Do you need to then disinfect your well? We have uh, information on disinfecting the well on, on our website, but you know, if you can a licensed water well contractor, they have to go through uh, quite a bit of schooling. We, again, as the State Health Department, inspect the wells, inspect their work. They do a good job. They are a great resource. If you're uncomfortable with disinfecting your well, contact your local uh, water well contractor. And again, or you can go to our website and do what he's doing. Nitrates, Sarah talked about it. Again, nitrate, if you have elevated nitrates, it means something's getting into your water. Adults can handle nitrates. Again, it's with infants and pregnant women. Their gut isn't developed uh, of a child that's uh, less than a year of age. Then they could come up with that. You've heard of um, blue baby syndrome or methahemoglobinemia. Uh, so you want to make sure that, that if you have a baby that's drinking the water, no people that do, they should be checking for nitrates. My wife was a public health nurse for Cass County also, and she had a, she had a uh, baby that was failing to thrive, and they had a cesspool that was 10 feet from a shallow well, from a sandpoint well. And when she came out and did her first visit, she was a WIC nurse. They uh, she found out about that, and they got her off that water, and the baby was great after that, rather rapidly, actually. So again, infants and pregnant women, if you have high levels of nitrate, uh, you can either drill a new well, or you can get a usually point of use type of device. Uh, which means it's going to treat the water where you're going to drink it. Reverse osmosis is a common one. This is a map kind of showing where we have elevated nitrates in some of our wells. Arsenic. The dots, Minnesota has arsenic naturally uh, from the glaciers. They are, and we also have some elevated uh, arsenic, excuse me, where uh, there's preservatives, uh, where they're doing preservatives with the logs, et cetera. If you have a well that is 2008 or newer, it was tested for arsenic. So you can look on the, the Minnesota Well Index, which you can find in our websites. And if you don't have the year results, then you should be able to find what that was. If you have not, you should test it one time. At least you know what it's at, one time. And again, similar type of thing for treatment. If you're interested in that, I do have a few uh, treatment things, uh, pay, uh, pieces of paper for the cars. Again, as I said, um, reverse osmosis is one of the common ones that is used. Um, and you can also have the option of drilling in the well. Lead, no lead level is safe. Uh, pipes are the big concern, as it says lead pipes. If you have a system that's older than 1985, and you should test it for lead, because lead might have been used in the copper pipes. So again, all you need is a one-time test. See what it is. If there is indicators that you have lead, or if, you're, if you have an older system and you're not testing it, flush the water out. Because the, the water is going to get elevated lead when it sits in the pipes overnight. The longer it sits in the pipes, the seasonal person that sits in the pipes, it's going to be more concentrated. If you have an older system, the good thing is you can flush it out. Let it run for 60 seconds. Not in your septic system or steroid, man. But let it run in the morning. Uh, if you want to use it, water the plants, etc., something like that. But flushing is really good. You'll see in cities, they flush the lines all the time. If you have a seasonal system, the way you start up your system, you should flush. It's very important to flush out all the stuff that's in your when you start your drinking water system up the next year. And again, that is, is in many of the components 
was in many of the components of wells, pumps, etc. So as I said, you know, flush your system. Options again are, you know, with this it's in the pipe, so you really can't throw in the well. So you could be looking at reverse osmosis distillation of bottled water, potentially. You have elevated lead, especially given with children. Children, infants. Manganese, so there it occurs naturally in Minnesota. Um, there's no federal or state regulations on it at all. If you know an infant um, that is using that water, it should be tested for manganese at least once. You should test it too, see what the uh, levels are. If you get a carbon filter, it can reduce those by about half of that. And as my wife would always say, we we'll would always promote breastfeeding. The concern with this, again, is if you're using that water and dry formula, it could be concentrated. So the baby is going to have development issues if there's high manganese in that water. So if you have a baby that's drinking that water, you should definitely check it for manganese. Oh, oh, oh. Okay, take that. Ooh. Real fast. I know I saw somebody nodding back there, so I had to help. It's warm. Wow. Where's that one? Does anybody know what I just said? Now we're going for inspections. Okay. Sarah's buying beer. Didn't turn my phone off. I did. This is the second time. It's on no noise. I'm just telling you. Okay. Now we want to look at your water system. Okay. Basic stuff. But you should look at it at least once, and then maybe you've already done it. Or so the things you want to look at, yeah, the important components of the drinking water system that's already out in your yard, you know, is the wellhead. There's one right out here. As you walk down the sidewalk, there's a wellhead, there's the well. The distribution system, you know, there's a hose out there that's sitting on the ground. Does that have backflow prevention on it? Or if you have back pressure in your system and siphoning, is it sucking whatever up into your drinking water system? And then you're, like I talked about before, when you walk outside and look at that wellhead, you look around, what's next to that wellhead? Can you manage it? Can you move things around, get rid of things? Are you putting lots of pesticides on the grass next to your wellhead? Et cetera. So with the wellhead, you already see that they've got some tape around their wellhead off here. It's not duct tape, it's electrical tape, which is always much better. It doesn't matter. <laughs> conduit, so it, it, you'll see where the conduit is on that well. Um, it's probably moved, the, the box has probably been hit. So they've done some jerry rigging and repaired it. They've sprayed some foam in it to protect it and seal it, which is good. I mean, it's, you know, it's not quite cold, but it's good. I mean, they don't have, we see it, well, I'll show you pictures. You want to make sure that, that everything is protected in your casing. You, you don't want to give that the, the contaminants on the surface an opportunity to go down to your drinking water and then you're going to drink it, basically. So the conduit, see there's another one with electrical tape. And again, if this is pushed away from the well, the electrical connection, as you see the close-up on that. So that's got bugs in it. And those bugs are going right down that casing. Because we live in Minnesota, it moves. It has frogs, so those will move. This is what we see in the field probably the most, is where conduit has moved. It's a simple thing. You get the electrician out there, make sure that that is sealed, so it doesn't have that opportunity for anything to get in there. So again, outside, this is the wellhead, very similar wellhead is outside. It's got a screen, it's got a vent, they all have vents. Underneath this side of the wellhead, it's got a vent underneath that. You can feel the screen underneath it. You can feel the screen on this one outside. The screen on this picture and on that uh, wellhead outside is intact. But we see them without the screen. We see where the screen has been, uh, you know, had damage to it. It's, a bit, you know, it's really simple. But you got to look at it to see that it's there. And anything can get in there, crawl down there, and you're going to drink it. <laughs> so in this one, they basically got rid of the vent, they put a plug there, which is not good either because they need the vent to operate properly. Oh, uh, ooh. Back. So you see this is uh, each well since 74 has had a, um, has been a unique number. 
On that tag is that well, your well, if you have a, a family, is your well a unique number, you can look it up on the Minnesota Well Index, you can find out all the information on your well, how deep it is, when it was drilled, etc. if it was drilled since 1974. Excuse me. And before that, no. And before that, not. Yes. Yep, so who knows? Could be. But again, my well, my house is 1960. Uh, my health, my well is drilled by Freeman Brothers, who have drilled wells for generations. Call them up. They know everything about my well. So the well driller, is a good well driller, will keep track of all that information. So if it's prior to that and you want to find out about that, call your well driller. See what it is. So protect. So we've got casing broken because somebody drove into it. This is not protection. This is simple protection. You know, just throw up some boulders. And we have a difficult time running into that. We see in the driveways and things of that nature. I'm mean, just going to put it backwards. So uh, one other thing that I talked that was before grading, you want to make sure that technically this is not a legal well. But, I mean, technically it's supposed to be a foot above the grade. But if you if you want stuff to grade away from your wellhead, you want to push. We have stuff when, the, when that rain came that I drove through so that it goes away from the wellhead. So just make sure landscape that it's away from the wellhead. It's not a pocket that's coming around your wellhead. So it can go through. So then distribution system. What's in your house? Do you have a boiler? Oh, uh, is your boiler connected? Do you have a boiler that is constantly getting water? Do you have backflow prevention devices on your boiler? Uh, the hose outside, it has a backflow prevention of anti-siphon on the faucet. There's a little thing above it, it's got, it siphons air so you can't get back pressure so it won't suck anything up. Do you have one of those on your hose connection? Maintenance, do you have a water softener? Anybody have a water softener? Everybody has a water softener. Do you do maintenance on your water softener? Do you look in the salt tank when you put that in? Sometimes we see some really nasty stuff in the brine tank. You want to make sure that that's okay. You want to make sure where's that softer draining tube. You don't. So boiler. This is a boiler that's hooked up with a garden hose that's turned on constantly. So that system is under pressure. If you get back pressure on that, it could suck whatever back into the drinking water system and you could be drinking. This is a water softener drain that's connected directly to the sewer. No gap, no break. All that would need to be done is Take that out of the pipe, make it a break, make it air. You know, break the siphon. Simple stuff. So this is good and proper. This is a double check valve on the boiler system, so it can prevent anything back pressure. This is a uh, reduced pressure zone valve. You see, uh, big water systems they're really expensive, spending again. This is a floor heat, but it prevents that from ha uh, back siphoning your system. You have floor heat. Simple thing to do for the water softener. This is a good and proper one. You know, it's a gap, air gap, like I talked about, break it, at least that's broke. This is, again, where they just put it, stuck it down into the sewer. Not a good thing. Outside, this is the type of uh, hose connection that's outside. The newer ones all have buses will have this. These are back hose preventers right here that you can screw right on to the, to the hose pit and prevent that. Common things. So do you have any leaks in your system? Do you check that? Is your pump coming on when nothing's being used? Do you have a leak somewhere? A good, a good thing that you can look at is the pressure uh, gauge going up and down. You have a pressure gauge, you should have a pressure gauge, by your pressure tank. And again, when nothing's being used, is that pressure coming on and off in your house, in your drinking water system? A thing to check. Do you have, you know, is there something that's, it adds up fast really, really fast if something is running. So again, for the septic system. Do you follow your recommendations and treatment devices where you just always just turn stuff on and it turns on, so what the heck? Or you do maintenance on somewhat of a regular basis. And I mentioned before, if you've got pipes, you've done some plumbing, make sure they get rid of the pipes. And the pipes that are not being used because they can harbor bacteria in those lines. And if you get back pressure that, you can have a surge of that going into your drinking water system. So lastly, I'm going to talk about um, the wellhead protection zone. So we want to help minimize what can get into your well by, again, just looking outside. 
What's in your yard? <laughs> What's in your neighbor's yard? What's where that portion of rear is? Well, you want to make sure. Is there, okay, are you ready? I'm going to come, I'm going to go, okay? We set this up. If you have wells that's not being used, that you should be sealed. Your board, uh, your soil and water guy, Don? Andy. Oh. Andy, he's got cash. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Uh, soil and water, we do have some reoccurring state funds, and uh, abandoned well sealing is an eligible practice. So, uh, Tim Fritz in our office is the, the contact. So if you know that, do you have neighbors and you know there's an abandoned well somewhere? No. Where's your guy? He writes tonight, 0017. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Thank you. Uh, and again, uh, that's stuff by license water contractors, so you can track those things. So again, modern. This was out of Deer Lake. Is that new? Well, that's one of the new main ones. Gas? Well, not good. Uh, again, abandoned wells. Get up there. There's your segue into the soil and water office. So, um, in the one that I got enough copies back there, in the middle of it, it shows a wellhead protection zone. Um, again, you just have to stand up in your yard and look around and know what's in your yard and the neighbor's yard. And, and can you do stuff about that? Do you not fertilize right next to the well? Is it graded away? Do you have protection? Basic kind of stuff, but good stuff to help reduce the risk of your drinking water system. All right. So, okay. so we're going to finish up talking about what we can do to have and make once we have a good septic system and is keep a good septic system. So this is the part in particular. As I'm going along, if you have questions make sure you ask, because the last thing I want is people to leave here with burning septic questions, right? So, and after the course is over, if you have like site-specific questions about your septic or your well, um, we'll hang around. And the best thing is, I just noticed the sun has come out, right? So we're actually going to, for anyone who wants to, they're actually going to pump the septic tank here. So you can see how proper septic tank maintenance happens. And we'll talk about some amazing things that are gonna happen during that, so. So, you know, we think that once we get our septic system pumped, okay, that's gone, and we did a good thing. Mm -hmm. Where does that go? Well, sometimes, I asked, sometimes right. Sometimes it so. goes on, on fields and in the ground, but not always, right? Um, so, I will talk about first statewide, and this state is a little old, so it may have changed a little bit, but historically, when your tank is pumped, about 70% of that septage has historically been land applied. There are actually federal regulations called the 503s, that are very detailed, that include particularly liming. So you, put, you have to put a lot of lime and really raise the pH, and it kills off 99% of the bacteria and viruses. It's applied at ergonomic rates. It has to meet setbacks. There's all these cropping restrictions. Very detailed requirements. Uh, the other 30%, and I think that percentage is rising, to be honest with you, is taken to a wastewater treatment plant. But I do want to highlight, so wastewater treatment plants create something called sludge. Every system out there does. Guess where the sludge for the wastewater treatment plant goes? No. No, no, the effluent does. The sludge, which is kind of the heavy solids. And again, I can't actually speak specifically for Grand Rapids, but I can tell you most wastewater treatment plants, it's land applied. So one way or another, some of the byproducts of all of our wastewater is being put onto fields, just like all the manure from the animals. Except when you do it with human waste, it's much more regulated. <laughs> Having grown up on a dairy farm, <laughs> yeah. And they apply it, of all the manure is supposed to be put on in ergonomic rates and all that too. So the bottom line is, is that we are putting, and again, to me, you have to really think about that we are recycling nutrients. So if you are applying it and you're growing a crop and you're doing it safely, we're taking the nitrogen and phosphorus that's in the septage, we're using it again. So that is what's done. So, um, and that's a good slide I don't have, so it was a good question about where does it go when they, clean, when they empty your tanks. So that is what we're going to focus on first is really what is maintenance, and then we'll talk about, I would say, tips within your house to lengthen the life of your system. So the key thing is, and 
You are the people in the room who already know this. It's all your neighbors, right? If I had a dollar for every time I heard, I'd never pump my septic tank. And that's the last thing I'll tell you a maintainer wants to hear because that job is going to be very unpleasant. Because what happens over time is your tank basically just fills up with sludge. So maintenance is mandatory. It's actually written into our state code that you have to have your system looked at every three years. Um, and we'll talk about what needs to happen during that. But again, what they're going to do during a service visit is they're going to clean your tanks. Uh, and again, when we say clean, it's not, when they leave, it's not like spick and span, right? They leave a little leftover, and that little leftover, maybe hearts start, start things. I mean, they get as much out as they can, but it's a septic tank, right? That's buried in the ground. If you have an effluent screen during the service visit, they're certainly going to clean that as well. Um, if you have a pump tank with an alarm, they should be actually checking that your alarm works, because an alarm is just like anything else. You could have tripped a circuit years ago and not know it. So does the alarm, because all that is is there's a high water float, that if the water level gets too high, the alarm turns on. So I would want to know that's working. And again, they also should be walking over the area of your drain field. And the other thing they're actually supposed to do is give you a report. That report tells you, do you need any repairs done? How many gallons are removed? It actually is required to say where are they taking it to. So, um, and I know that's something that not all maintainers do, even though it's written into rule. But the key thing I like to make the analogy is it's just like going to get your oil change. Do you know how they always give you a report? And I know some of you do it yourselves, but if you win somewhere, right? And they tell you, like, here's the recommended other things, right, besides changing your oil. And it's kind of the same thing. Are there, again, any repairs needed? Did your baffle fall off? That's not debatable to me, right? That needs to be fixed. So here is a device, and it's a little hard to see in this picture. I should replace this, but this is actually my coworker, Dave, and he's hold, holding something called a sludge judge, which is kind of like Kleenex now to me. It's actually any device you can use that will bring up a profile of the tank. So you can actually measure how much sludge is on the bottom and how much scum is on the top. This is not very commonly done because the biggest reason is when the company shows up with their pump truck, guess what they're going to do? They're going to clean out your tank, and at that point, it doesn't exactly depend, mat, matter at that point how much sludge and scum is there. But I would tell you that you as an owner, and I know you all want to be there when they get your tank pumped, you should be there. And you should say, how dirty was my tank? So maybe you're on the interval of pumping it every three years, and maybe it's pretty full already, and maybe you should be doing it every two years. So to me, there is a great opportunity, and the other real reason why it's not super common for people to do to the measuring is because they do show up in their pump truck and it's relatively inexpensive to get your tank pumped. There are parts of the country where getting your tank pumped can be five, six hundred dollars, which is not what you're paying, right? No, right? So if it's five or six hundred dollars, they do a lot more measuring, right, to determine because, and you know why it's five or six hundred dollars there? Because what it costs to dispose of it at the wastewater treatment plant is two or three hundred dollars alone. So they have to pay that and they have to drive to your house, they have to pay their employees, they have to have health insurance. You know, the whole the whole business model is just a little different. So they show up in those those areas with a service truck and they measure and they send the pumper truck out when needed. But here, because things are relatively inexpensive, and you know, every two, three years getting your tank pumped to most people. Not to everybody, to some people a couple hundred dollars, sometimes they don't have that in their budget, but it's something we do need to budget for. Um, so I, I mentioned that I live in Minneapolis and I've lived in Minneapolis now for right around 20 years. And I've, a couple years ago, I added up what I paid for sewer and water while I've lived in Minneapolis. I paid for a well and a septic. So I know those bills are tough sometime when it comes because it's one big bill all at one time unless you happen to be lucky enough to be an area where you get funding or it goes on your property taxes, there are some examples of that. But if you really take that cost and you spread it over the life of how long a septic system lasts, they're, they're relatively um, economical. So when it comes to uh, cleaning the tank, um, they are removing the sludge and scum. And they do remove the liquid layer because it's kind of like you have to, but the real key is, is that they're removing the sludge and scum. Again, it's done, done by licensed and bonded professionals. So again, since 1996, 
anyone who touches a septic system from the person cleaning your tank to actually the county regulator or all go through a pr the, actually I think in the in the US there's maybe one other state that has a similar program but a very extensive certification and training program um, and typically that word sludge is pretty accurate right it's not this light fluffy sludge <laughs> So they typically are going to need to do some flushing and back flushing and or sometimes they'll be out there with a big pry bar kind of getting that solids off the bottom. There's also a device on the market with really rough tanks that's kind of like a blender for your septic tank where they'll mix it up to make it into a slurry. So but what I want to highlight is it's not as simple as just dropping the hose there and walking away. That's not, that's not, it's, it's work. Right? So. Uh, the key thing about getting your tanks clean is that it has to happen through manholes. So manholes are large diameter access. So in this picture, you'll see inspection ports. Those are often sometimes on older tanks over the inlet or the outlet. But the only way to get a tank clean is by going through a manhole. If they put a hose down this, they will suck out liquid and will not remove the sludge and scum. And so what happens if you only see one of these at the surface? It's called a shovel. And you have a choice. You may dig that up once, or you may need to dig it up every three years. And I say you, that could be you as the homeowner, it could be the maintainer when they show up, or probably the better solution is the first time you dig it up or they dig it up, is that you add a riser and bring it to grade so they don't need to do that every time. That's why we went to requiring up the surface because you need to access them. But I do want to highlight, there was a reason why we used to bury them is because it was safer. So this tank has four to five feet of liquid, and every year a child in the US or multiple children die in a septic tank. It happened on the North Shore two years ago, and it was at the grandparents' house. The lid had been taken off in winter because there was a problem by the property owner, not secured back on, toddler standing on it, lid flipped, they didn't find him for three hours. They didn't know where he was. Someone looked the other way, right? A bunch of kids out in the yard. And no one ever thinks, because I've talked to homeowners, when I walk up to the yard and they have plywood covering their tank lid, they're like, oh, nobody goes over there. They know better. The other thing is pets. Horses, dogs, other things can end up there that we love. And so we do not, just understand your tank is dangerous. That being said, if you have a secure, I mean, those big concrete lids, I can barely get them off. <laughs> I just slide them a little, because I don't know if I'm gonna be able to lift it get it back on. But some of the lighter fiberglass lids, they have screws, they have to be screwed back in place. So if you're ever, and again, most people don't go in their tank, but sometimes people, right, they do stuff themselves, they MacGyver, whatever it might be. <laughs> so just understand that that tank is a dangerous environment. So a couple other things about this picture. Um, again, this in this right case right here, and there's one of these outside. This is I can tell it's a pump tank because there's a pedestal and electricity. The only time you're going to have that is if you have electricity with your system. See a bunch of straw, and have you ever done this? Right, straw. Hey, some people do it because they're worried about freezing. The thing I do like in the background here is I see a wheelbarrow. If you do this in the fall and you leave it year round, then you don't grow grass. Grass is an insulator too, so you do want to have vegetation growing over your system. And I'm not saying everyone needs to put straw, and we'll talk about freezing coming up. Some people do. If you've never had a freezing problem, you're probably not going to have one, right? Um, but we'll, we'll talk about that too. So sludge and scum have to be removed. The only way to do it is through a manhole. So F1 screens need to be cleaned. The screen can be, it has to be washed off directly into the septic tank. I guess I know of a few companies that will actually swap out a screen and not clean it on site. Um, it's done at the inlet of the septic tank if the tank isn't being pumped. So if you do it any other time than when you're doing service, the reason why you do it as the inlet is you're washing off all these solids, right? And you don't want them to go out to your drain field. There are actually some of the screens out in the market that actually have, for instance, a ball that will float up so that the sludge that kind of, because when you pull it, some of it kind of comes off just by the nature of it. Um, but the key thing is you can think of that ball comes up also. If you don't put the screen back in, it's not going to work. So how often do you need to clean your septic tank? Well, technically the code does not say you have to clean it every three years. It says as needed. 
Because it is just like saying how often you need to change your oil. A time interval, right? <coughs> well, we all drive different miles, right? Well, the same as with our septic system, we do use them differently. You can have two side-by-side, -side, three bedroom homes. One house might have two people in it, but guess what? She makes wedding cakes and cupcakes out of her house and sells them. And then you have the family of six living in the three bedroom. Right, so those homes actually, who knows, with the baking, because I actually saw that one of those systems and their screen was just cake with something that looked like cottage cheese. Right, because of all the fats and oils and greases that were going down the drain. So it really depends on how you use your system. So it's impacted by water and product use. It has to be looked at. And I really should change this word to assess because the word inspect means something usually very different to people. I mean, technically when they're out there, that is inspection, but it's not inspection. I'm checking to see if you're compliant inspection. So when they are out there doing maintenance, they are not out there to turn you in because your system isn't compliant. Every septic system, whether it's compliant or non-compliant, will work better if it's maintained. And I'm not saying we're perfect, but you should st all systems need to be maintained. So they're not going to turn you in because some, because your baffle fell off, right? They're just going to tell you, you need to repair your baffle. But we've been very clear in this state that we don't want maintenance to be a way we catch problems because we don't want to deter people from doing maintenance. So the rule of thumb, again, is that you should have your system looked at every one to three years. And I have had people say, oh, it's a seasonal cabin. We're hardly ever there. Okay, so let's say you went five years and your baffle fell off at year one. Now you've gone four years sending any scum layer out to your drain field. So it doesn't matter, and I have seen, so I stayed at a cabin actually not too far from here. And it was a family cabin, and we got in there two years in a row, and they wouldn't take any money. And I said, well, next year when I come, we're going to have the tank pump. That's my gift to you, right? And they're like, oh, that's so nice of you. So we had someone come out and clean the tank. So, And I went out the next day. So he came the morning, and I went out the next evening, and the 1,000-gallon septic tank was full. That was a three-bedroom house with a bunkhouse. No one has any of those, right, where extra people sometimes sleep. We had 10 people at that house. It was designed for a maximum of six showering, doing laundry, I don't know, letting the toilet run. I have no idea how we used a thousand gallons in a day and a half. So some people's cabins, none of yours are ever used like that. But some cabins I think can get used more in the summer than some people's homes can be all year. So regardless if it's seasonal. But I do want to go back, it does matter how you use your system. So again, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't have it looked at every three years because you could have a really necessary repair that needs to happen. The other thing I want to point out about this is if you do a remodel or if you build a new home, those are both times when a lot of kind of toxic construction debris can go down the drain. The sheet rockers, the painters, right, drywall, you name it, they're going to put wastewater down the drain, even if you probably tell them not to. So you can kind of start, that can really put a lot of toxic load into your system. So if you do any of those, bigger projects, it's a good time to just get your tank clean to make sure you have a good um, bacterial community in your tank. So what about all those additives they sell? You can go. I'm sure the local hardware store here sells them. Menards, the big boxes, they all have them. So almost every year I talk at a big show. Uh, it used to be in National and now it's in Louisville. It used to be called the Pumper Show. Now they call it the Wet Show. But it's the same show. People still call it the Pumper Show. And I often talk there, and I will say this very same thing there, that they're not needed. And I'll say the bottom line is there's no research that supports any of them. And right across her hall from me, and this is a big show, there's people selling products, millions to, I don't even know how much, right? Enough that they advertise in the middle of the night on TV. I don't know if you've ever seen the commercial. It's like, oh, if only I used Riddix. And she's like crying because her yard's being torn up. And that's a perfect example of a company who actually contacted us at the university and wanted us to promote their product. And when I asked, I said, well, where's the research? They don't have any. They can't give me any. They give me testimonials, you know, which doesn't amount to anything. So there are sometimes um, advertised that they're starters. Well, the bottom line is, in a cup of sewage, there's a million to a billion bacteria. 
you don't need any more, right? When you flush the toilet, you're feeding it every time you flush. And then, these are the ones that concern me the most. They say, if you use this product, you won't need to pump your tank. So then where's all that stuff going? They're actually what are called emulsifiers, which make the tank not naturally stratify. So yes, then things go out. And maybe someday this will change. Maybe someday someone will develop a product and actually test it that is shown to optimize the bacteria in the tank. Because there are a few in the big wastewater treatment plant world, but the things that have dominated the septic world are snake oil. You're like flushing 20s. You should just take those 20s, and you should instead just get your tank clean. And as far as other things, I've had people really ask about the dead chicken. Nope, just eat the chicken, use the toilet, right? Yeast, cabbage, you name it. Yeast does some of my favorite things, right? Beer, bread, all those good things that it ferments. It doesn't want to live in the septic tank. Is it going to hurt to dump a little yeast down there? No, but it's not going to do any good either. So there's just none of, and I, we call them old wives tales, right? People think they have thought over the years, but they don't optimize the bacteria in the tank. That's the bottom line. So I do want to mention if you have a pump tank, they should be looking in that tank when they're there. One, they should again be confirming that the pump is operational, um, and they might need to clean it. And I know some just as a default clean it no matter what, they don't bother measuring. They're just, because over time, some of that sludge can carry over to your pump tank, and the last thing you want is that pump pumping um, sludge to your drain field. The other thing that they should check is, is your pump replaceable? Is it operating rate? Because there will be an interval when that pump is going to need to be replaced. Could be on December 26th, right? And so if it's on that day, will they be able to replace it in the middle of winter? So is it accessible? Is it elevated, replaceable, operable, alarm? That's a really easy thing for someone to check who does this every single day. They can just see that looking in the tank. And never, ever, ever, ever bury that lid. So how do you hire a pumper or a maintainer? So certainly referrals, just like any other industry, is the best, I think, the best method. So if they do good work, it gets around. Um, often people start with this question, how much does it cost? So sometimes you can find someone who's $25 cheaper, but that's exactly what you might get. It's not $25 cheaper, but just not as good a job. The cheapest isn't always the best, just like everything else. So there is, you can go online and find a list. I will highlight that the PCA list, who licenses everyone, is organized by the county that they live in. Because they're not fancy enough to go with zip codes like everybody else. But that's ultimately. So you just have to keep in mind, if you're looking, many of them work more than in just the county they live in. But if they are driving long distances, that's very likely also going to add to the cost, though, because it's driving, it's gas, right? So you could also ask some questions. Do they pump through the manhole? I hope they say yes. You could say, would you pump through my inspection port? <laughs> if they say yes, well, you might want to go to the next person on the list, right? <laughs> um, do they back flush? Do they recommend additives? And certainly cost. I'm always going to ask cost, right? I love getting a deal. But ultimately, you also want to know that they're going to do a good job. This is only something you're doing every three years. So when you're looking at the cost, again, minor differences between one company and another shouldn't drive your decision. So soil tr uh, treatment system maintenance. So I mentioned they should walk over that area. Just because they're more knowledgeable, you can do this too. But just do they see anything that looks out of the ordinary? So are, did you hit one of those caps with a lawnmower? Guess what? You can buy those too, right? They're not fancy caps. Um, is the uh, rain and snow melt going away from the drain field? The same thing with your well. We do not want the septic system to have to take a lot of rainwater. And particularly, I've seen it more with trench systems, or it can happen with mounds though too, like particularly on the upslope end of the mound, is it catching water that then needs to soak in there? It's just going to stress your system more. So you just want to keep an eye on too, are there changes? Is there an area that's continually wet? Not a good sign. So when it comes to maintenance, a couple other things to keep in mind is compaction is bad. So remember how we wanted aerobic conditions in the soil? We need the soil to not be compacted for that to happen. So you want to keep traffic, vehicles, and animals 
And so I'm really not talking about little Fido here. I have a St. Bernard. He might move into the larger animal category. But I'm talking about particularly uh, deer up this way. And if you had any sort of horses or cattle or goats, anything that likes regular traffic over the same area will compact the soil as well. So um, if you do have inspection pipes in your yard that are sticking up feet, they, to me, look relatively hideous, and I love septic systems, right? So they can be, after kind of final grade is established, if you get a new system, you don't want to bury them. You do want to know where they are. They can be put in nice landscaping boxes. They can be cut relatively flush so you won't hit them with the lawnmower. But I want people's septic system as much as possible to blend in with their property, so they really can be cut off. I do want to highlight, if you have a newer mound system, Older mounds don't have this, but the newer mound systems, we now put clean outs on the end where we can actually flush the lines. Because they have typically inch and a half or two inch pipe in them, and after you send a dose of wastewater out, the water drains out, you have an empty pipe sitting. Over time, that empty pipe may catch a few solids, but the other thing it'll do, because it's got wastewater in it and oxygen, is it grows bacteria, right? They grow everywhere, right? Everywhere. On our skin, they're everywhere. So ultimately, over time, what we have found is those pipes start to build up this kind of slime in them. So we put in this way to actually clean and flush them. So this isn't something you necessarily will have to do every three years, but it's actually a good idea. Um, if, you have, if you have those cleanouts, maybe every other pump out, that you actually have your lines clean if you have them. On older systems, the only way to do that is to actually dig them up, cut off the end, and put a clean out. So they usually only do that when there's a problem. So now we have a preventative measure. So if you have it and you've never had them clean, next time you're out there, it probably won't add that much more cost. Let's flush out the lines while we're there. So Sarah, what? Oh, yeah. Can I ask a question? <laughs> <laughs> Why do they have the inspection pipes? Uh, so, well, there's two, are you talking about in the drain field itself? Yeah, yeah in the drain field. Yeah, so I don't, would I have a picture? No, no oh, you do I don't. I, I'm sure I have one coming up. So there's two. So I mentioned in some of these you will have a, now you'll have this clean out. I do want to highlight clean outs are different than inspection ports. Clean outs are for the purpose of like actually flushing water and or sending equipment down there to clean the line. If you hit one of those with a lawnmower and the pump turns on the next time you have a geyser, a little geyser, it won't be like Old Faithful or anything. But that's a, that would be an imminent public health threat. The other inspection ports you have on in your drain field are either with older mounds, will actually sometimes be inch and a half or two inch paper, they'll be four inch and they'll have caps on them. The purpose of those is to measure if you have any ponding in your system. And if you have a in-ground system, a trench, a bed, a drain field, a leach field, whatever you call it, it might have water standing in it and that might be very normal. Depends on the system. But for the most part, they are designed to have some standing water in them as they get older. If you have a mound and you pop the cap on your mound, unless it recently dosed, if you have a lot of ponded water in it, it's a problem. And I would talk to my service provider maintainer about it. You mentioned the cleanouts on the mound. Uh, and a while back, you talked a lot about the lint and the fabric stuff that you oh, yeah. We've cleaned out laterals on uh, mounds and gotten a large wheelbarrow full of lint out of these things, so that it is a, an issue. Also, one family had three large dogs and they were bathing them inside all the time. We got a ton of dog hair out of the pipes and also cigarette butts. So there's things that can get through the pump and end up in that drain field. Like, they have nowhere else to go, so mm -hmm. that's why they have the cleanouts on them. Yeah, library. this picture shows cleanouts, and I know they're hard to see because there's a lot of shading. This picture is actually taken up by Ely. We also can't see it very well, but there's water squirting up. They can actually check how the system is working by checking the squirt heights. But, yep. This isn't a good time for me to ask a question. You mentioned lint. And nobody's going to mention about lint filters on your washing machine. I have a slide coming up. Yeah. Well, you do. I do, I promise. So, um, I get a, oh, go ahead. I'm confused. Um, I do have an inspection port, two of them, in the leach field. Uh -huh. Then I have an inspection port on the lid of the manhole cover. What's that for? Um, really, the purpose of the one on top of the manhole would be, could you check, I mean, and we don't do this a lot, you could pop that cap and check the sludge and scum without opening up the whole tank. 
Plus, they used to be buried. So well, yeah, they I used to be buried, but I so I think a lot of the new ones don't have those anymore. Don't have the inspection pipe over the lid, but it's better that your lid be at grade. And and again, if you for some reason can't stand the lid or you're worried about the safety issue, a little bit of mulch, an inch or two, kind of just to cover it. And again, I don't want that buried, but you know if it's and they do also make very fancy lids now. If you really want it to blend in. They make green ones, they make ones that look like rocks. You can put something decorative over the top that can be moved, right? There are ways to, I would just say, hide them without covering them. Build a deck over it. A deck? No. No decks. That would be the definition of a bad idea. Right? Yep. If you don't know what kind of septic system you have, yep. can like the inspection guys tell you? Yeah, so the question is if you don't know what kind of system you have, can, can an inspection person tell you? So the first thing you should do is determine who's your permitting authority. Is it the county or the city? And see if they have any records. So in some areas they have very old records. Not always great records, but they have very old records. My next question would be, if you recently bought a property, like if you owned it a long time, is um, there should have been some, I mean, in theory, there should have been something done maybe when you bought it. What's required is disclosure, not always inspection, but were there any records with that process and who maintained it, they may know something. And finally, a maintainer and or inspector. You just have to be careful. If you call an inspector out to your property and say you want an inspection, that can start a process of requiring your system to be upgraded. If you're ready for that, I'm gung-ho with it, but um, just keep in mind that there could be a big bill at the end of that visit because when they fill out the state inspection form, they're required to um, submit that to the permitting authority. If you have them come out to do maintenance or just take a look at it, they're not required to file any, any forms unless there's specific forms in a city or county, but most of them don't. So there's a very difference between asking someone's opinion versus asking for a, a compliance inspection, because that starts an upgrade trigger, because if your system is found to be failing, if it's an imminent public health threat, you have to fix it within, within 10 months or less. And if it's found to be failing, that interval is based on the local permitting authority. It's usually a year or two. It, it does depend, and I don't know what it is where I'm standing today. Does anyone know? Three years. Three? Three? Two. 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 It's like, I know there's some realtors in the room. They would know. Do you have a transfer of property in Itasca County, too? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Compliance inspected point of sale. If you have one inspected or for compliance, uh, I'm getting out of here. Some point in time, do I want to give them a building or replace the building? No, I agree. So even like, yeah, this is, so his comment is it's a good thing to know. I just know people who may not have the immediate financial resources to pay for a $15,000 bill. It was the same thing with my dad. He knew his septic system wasn't compliant. He knew before he sold it, he was just going to fix it. So it wouldn't be an issue at property transfer. It's going to get checked and transfer anyway. Is it required to be? They said it is. Yeah. Here. So that is not a, right now. Unfortunately, I wish it was a statewide requirement everywhere. So it's county by county right now, um, and so we've had we'll a lot see. of conversations about moving it statewide because then it would just be uniform. So you, but that doesn't stop a sale. I just want to point out what's required is an inspection, and then it gets negotiated yeah. who's going to pay for it. But sometimes people don't want that. But I just. Just had a colleague who bought a property in Otter Tail and he negotiated it, right? So they had the inspection done and he knows all about septics and he said, well, I'd rather pay to get the septic system done myself, just take that off the listing price. And so that can be worked out. But it's a great time to work it out because there's money on the table. And you just described what I did three weeks ago. I, I bought my next door neighbor's property. They owned it for almost 30 years. I knew it was non-compliant. What did you call that system where it's just a couple of... A cesspool? Yeah. A seepage pit? A right. Okay. 15 feet from the lake. Okay. And, you know, and their, their thinking was, well, it's surrounded by sand. It's fine. It's like 15 feet from the lake. Now, it's surrounded by sand. It was like, yeah. it's almost like a direct cut. Now, now my, my question is, and I, and I took the same as your example. It's like, yeah. look, just get out of here. I'll, I'm going to make this the way it needs to be. Mm -hmm. I don't want to compromise with what you're going to save money on or something. Why does a person live in something for 25 years that's wrong like that? And and why doesn't the county get on them? I mean, this has been known to be non-compliant forever. Mm -hmm. So two questions. So one, why do people live in something? Uh, uh, OK, so I'm going to go back. Remember the system I grew up with that backed up into my house? 
it also was connected to a tile that went to the ditch. And so when I got this job and understood what I did, I went to my dad, who was a good farmer, cared about the land, and I said, Dad, how did you think that was okay? And he goes, well, you know, when it came out of the ditch, it looked clean. <laughs> and I said, well, would you have drank? I mean, he was honest. Like, you know, it looked clean. And I'm like, but would you have drank that water? And he goes, well, no. <laughs> and I said, well, guess who played in that water? Right? Guess who's swimming in your lake? Right? So some people have a hard time. And we live in the middle of a big A, you know, houses far apart. People really don't think they're really impacting. And they don't understand treatment. Like, they really, I mean, they probably honestly believe what you just said is that going through that sand, which is actually the worst case scenario, being close to a lake and sand is actually just means the, wa the wastewater is moving very quickly towards the lake, but people don't understand it. And so they're not the people sitting here tonight. So why doesn't the county enforce it? So if the county, and I'm not talking about this county specifically, any county, enforced upon everyone who had a septic system that was non-compliant today, they, they couldn't handle the work, the industry couldn't handle the work. So that is one reason why we use property transfers. It's kind of a more systematic approach. It's not perfect because there are things that can, like you hand it off to your kids and it's not an official property transfer. And that's been some of the argument is we should instead have systematic approaches there have been some Lakeshore associations, and there have been some county pilots. I know, I think it was Hubbard, county. Hubbard where they pick a couple they lakes did. every year and say, you have to prove you're compliant. They went all over the county. I know they there's the one lakes. county that's going township by township and making people do that. It takes political will. <laughs> and big often, time. it's a big bill that people don't want to pay. Like everybody, because I have yet to find the Minnesotan that says, I don't, I want, I don't want clean water but they have a hard time sometimes making the connection between their wastewater and water not being clean. Either because of lack of understanding or just simply it's not my problem. But it's not perfect. But. Well, in this case, they'd rather each have brand new trucks and cars. Oh, yeah. You know, I know. I mean. Well, that's what I said. When people tell me they can't afford to pump their septic tank, I ask them if they have a cell phone. Yeah. Right? Because yeah. <laughs> then the conversation is over. But cell phones and data plans cost right now, you just pay to get your tank clean. But, yeah. Uh, the question, we're talking about trying to keep our, our lake perfect. Uh, how do we deal with continuous agricultural land that either is attached or closely associated with our lake? What kind of rules? Well, yeah, so they are, okay, so you have any about, yeah, it's here. a whole other conversation, but like, so they just tried to pass nitrogen rules in Minnesota, and did, if you read anything, it did not go well. So when you figure out how to regulate A, you won. Well, no, this was about um, like having regulations on how you apply nitrogen to fields. So there's, I mean, it is a, and I, this often comes up, how do, you know, like, often in farming communities that are very animal driven, they're like, how can they do all that manure over here and we're regulated over here? And my comment always is, while we're here tonight, I, we can control our septic systems. We all can in this room and we need to have, if we don't have good septic systems, they're impacting the lake too. But it is, I would say, one of the three big issues that influences lakes. It's septic, it's shoreland, and it's egg. And you have to deal with all three of those to actually protect your lake. And it really will take political will at your level, at the county level, and at some level at the state level, because we're certainly not right now going to get it from the federal government. So the Clean Water Act, the, the Clean Water Act doesn't necessarily protect us. No, because EPA has limited power in Minnesota. Minnesota is much more progressive than the federal government. And I'm not talking about even the current administration. I'm saying in general. Being the land of 10,000 lakes, the Clean Water Legacy Act, we are spending, we, there is more money in this state to deal with water issues than there has ever been in my 20 year career. I don't know about you, Craig, because you've been around longer. I started when I was really young. But I, and I'll just add a comment to that, right on to that, and if you want to do something, there is, as Sarah said, there's money available. There are counties that have gotten inventory programs, and it's through funding grants through the state. And it takes, like Sarah said, political will. You've got to have commissioners that are willing to do that, and you have to have 
the grunt workers that are willing yeah, to do with it and to stay People with it. Really you have to have champions, and, and they have to stick with it. And you can do a lot of stuff because there is a lot of money available. I mean, there really is. Yeah, you want to do particularly something. low income people, because that's often an issue too, that not everybody does have fifteen thousand dollars to pay in their bank account to pay for the new septic. So particularly there's a lot of money in the state targeted towards low income. Um, and again, even though you might have I mean there's just a lot of people who do need help. So there are more resources out there. And those can be applied for again by the county. Um, so this is again through Clean Water Legacy we discovered in our league association, some of the people have spent their whole career working for major manufacturers. You can get grants through the company to help help take care of the lake. Clean yeah. Water. So they said there's there's companies, and I know there are private foundations. We got yeah. one meter on our association, IBM guy. Mm -hmm. I know he put some of his own money into it, but I don't know what the grants work, but. Three grand a year or so. It, it takes a lot of work and it takes you to stay yeah, on that work. He's tired. So. Yeah. <laughs> all right, well, I'm going to keep going here, otherwise, I won't get through. And I think at uh, seven, we all might blow up. So um, it's a long time and since it got nice. And so, what can I grow on the top of my septic system? So, in general, you should plant plants that prefer dry soils. And what I mean by that is, I just we really don't want irrigation systems. And in the middle of summer, you know how the grass turns brown and it still turns green the next year? It can handle periods of drought. So I'm not saying you have to have turf grass, but to me it's the easiest thing for most people to manage over the top of their septic systems. So this prevents the roots from interfering with the septic system. Keep in mind, if you're gonna plant something else, the larger the plant, the more extensive the root system is. Um, do not plant edible plants such as vegetable and herbs. And most people think that's because I'm worried about bacteria and viruses. I'm this much worried about that. What I'm worried about is most people's vegetable gardens, they water, and come fall, they're bare soil, which increases your likelihood of freezing. Um, do not place trees or shrubs on the top of your septic system. Never, ever, ever anything woody over the top of your septic system. So it's okay to frame the system with trees and shrubs. If you have a mound, we have a really nice fact sheet on our website about landscaping around mounds. It was not written by me, it was someone who actually was a, a landscape architect talking about what could the landscape look like. Um, again, using non-woody plants. If you're gonna plant a new tree, the minimum distance I would plant a new tree is 20 feet, but trees known for seeking water, such as poplar, maple, willow, elm, I wouldn't plant one closer than 50 feet from any soil treatment system, not just a mountain. So again, there's a fact sheet on our website. You can search for the word septic and university, it'll come up. It is septic.umn.edu. So when it comes to, again, mowing, this is the biggest thing that should drive across your drain field. No trees, no tractors, no cars, not having the wood pile on the other side. So again, this is, you know, small car, right? Not talking about big trucks or tractors, a riding lawnmower. And if you want to know how big can the riding lawnmower be, right, not a tractor. So just a little, um, again, a little lawnmower. And keep in mind though, even with a lawnmower like this, you can compact if the soil is wet. So you don't want to be out there mowing and causing, you don't want to see your ruts over the top of your septic system. So problems again, the coffee can, right? Here's a septic system that has no vegetation. Mounds are not snowmobile jumps, right? I've seen them, I've seen it. So if you have, again, four wheelers, right? So what about freezing? Anyone septic system frozen here? Yeah. Right, so there is a, a, a season when, or what, let's say a year, and there have been, I think, I know of three in the time I've been at the U now where we've had the worst winter for freezing, which is we have no snow and we get an extended period of very bitter cold. But I will still tell you, and he said, oh, in 2006, and maybe it was the case because I don't live up here, almost everybody's system froze. Well, I know of a few winters like that where they had water lines at eight feet freezing. So those winters, like if you have frost eight feet in the ground, you are really. But what I will also tell you is I guarantee you someone, there were some people whose system didn't freeze that year. Right? And, you, and so my only point in that is usually there are systems that are more susceptible. And some winters do test almost every system, but often there is a reason why a system froze. 
And so that's what I would just ask, because it's not usually just that it's cold, because it's always cold, right? And so, yeah, there are cold extremes, but was there a place that it froze in particular? Was it from the house to the tank? Was it in the pump line up to the mound? Do you have a saying in your pipe? Like, there can be sometimes things that could be corrected if, in fact, it did freeze. So some reasons, again, besides just that it was cold, could be a lack of cover, could be that the area was compacted, could be that you left for a long time and came back and it was still cold, right? So if you don't have heat going into the system, septic systems on their own, without heat coming from the house, will not stay warm. So yep, there's some bacteria in there, but remember how when you don't feed them, what happens to them? They die, they stop make, you know, creating any sort of energy in there, and it gets cold. So you do need heat going in, right, to keep the temperatures up, and that water coming in also has food with it. So uh, leaking plumbing, getting cold air in your system, poor drainage, there's lots of common reasons that can be problematic. So this is another thing, we have a good fact sheet on our website that kind of goes through this in a lot more detail. So figure out why and where, and if possible, fix the problem. And if you don't have a problem and it was just 2006 and it's never happened again, I wouldn't be worrying about it. There are very extreme measures people have taken. There's a heater out on the market. You can blow warm air in. There's insulating mats that people put out over their system. Those are all relatively costly and most people just simply don't need them. But if you have, and I had a guy who said, I want to use a cabin two, two weekends out of the winter. And what I suggested to him is something we talked about, pump out your tank, fill it up over the winter, because if you're using it two weekends, the way most people, again, if you just have a few people, you're not going to fill it up. Or if you're one of those people and you're willing to pay to have a heater blowing all the time, which has a, a large cost, you could do that. I mean, it really is like, what do you need to do so you can sleep in it, you know? Yep. I've been told that I should not pump my tank until the end of winter because a full tank is less apt to freeze. So the comment is, when should you pump your septic tank? Um, and so, uh, in general, most people should be pumping their septic tank from, I would just say, spring to fall. And not early spring because road restrictions are on and they can't be out on the roads. And you don't want to do it too late in the year because I don't want your tank going into winter empty. So the only reason I would pump my system in the late fall is if I wanted to do just what I just described and use it kind of more like a holding tank over the winter because I'm going to use it very limitedly. Everyone else should be pumping when it's warm which is Memorial Day to Labor Day, right? No, I'm just kidding. It's not quite that bad. But really that, I mean, and that is when a lot of tanks do get pumped. And really, it depends on the winter. We had a kind of a late winter this year, right? I don't know a lot of tanks were being pumped in April this year. So you really looking are at May to kind of that September-ish time. Yeah. And that's the best time to do it for the bacteria. They'll get better established when it's warmer. So things you can do, let your grass grow. So late summer, so that is August or Labor Day-ish, quit mowing so your grass gets longer over your soil treatment area. You can go further and do mulch. You can use extra warm water, meaning again, run the hot dishwasher, use warmer water in the laundry, take a bath, right? Things that put more warm water, because a lot of the water coming out of our house isn't that warm, right? It actually tends to be cooler. Fix leaks. All right, so the last thing I'm going to cover in 10 minutes, I promise, is just some homeowner tips. So these are things that you can do to extend the life of your system and protect the environment. So I did just say use warm water, but in general, using less water is better for our system. Think about how you use water. So spread out your water usage. Remember, avoiding the laundry day I just discussed. Be mindful of the products you use and limit the cleaners. Do not use your system as a garbage can. So, right, cigarette butts were an example that brought up, but people flush and put all kinds of things down the drain that aren't good for our septic system, but the municipalities don't want goldfish either, right? If you go to, and it's a really fun thing to do, go tour your municipal wastewater treatment plant, the first thing you'll see when you get there, the head of the plant 
is basically either a screen or a grate that catches all of the crap that people flush, not literal crap, other stuff, <laughs> garbage, that people flush, <laughs> right? Clothing, all that junk, they have to collect that and landfill it. So we should be landfilling. Yeah, wipes are one of the worst, which I have coming up here on the slide. And the last thing is if you have a problem with your septic system, don't wait for it to be a disaster, right? Don't wait for the sewage to back up in your house. So when we look at product usage around the home, the problems are, this is the worst one, anything that's designed to sanitize. Antibacterial soaps and wipes are reported by us to be used in 75% of homes. I remember when I, the last time uh, when I was babysitting, we used wipes to wipe babies' bottoms, right? When I was little, you used washcloths, right? You just wash those all over again. Apparently now, we as adults all need to wipe our bottoms too. Right? It is. They, they are so prevalent. Um, and the other thing about products is it's not usually just one product. It's this cumulative impact. If you're using lots of things that are antibacterial, that's when you really seem to have a problem. So products do have labels, but unfortunately, these labels aren't septic related. They're related to human health. But what I'll tell you in general is if something has a danger what it means is one case to a teaspoon is fatal. It's not good for your septic system. So we have, we have this product going up that is just this, and I don't know if any of you ever used iron out. So if you have a lot of iron, it's magic. You put it around the bowl and it just eats away the iron. But you can, when you're smelling it, you're like, oh. And if it got on your skin, it would burn it. And if you swallowed it, when I was a kid, we put Mr. Yuck symbol on it. But yet, guess where it was going, right? Right into our septic system, so. So I use a product called Wink, and it's for getting rust stains out, the rust stains that are created by our hard water. And it specifically says on it, that it's septic. safe for septic systems. <laughs> yeah. So how much can we believe the labels? You can't. No. <laughs> no, 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 no. advertising. <laughs> um, so um, the word septic safe is a marketing. All it is is marketing. Mm -hmm. I trust more products that say, and again, because none of this is regulated. But if it says biodegradable, that means, again, that if it gets onto nature, nature has a better chance of breaking it down. Right. Um, aside from that, and I have a website coming up where you can actually look up a product and it'll t give it an A, B, C, D, E, F. And most of those products, and I don't know that one in particular, won't get an A. And, and it's rated on its impact to health and the environment. But I will tell you, if it's not good for health and the environment, it's not good for your septic system. But I, I have it coming up here in a slide. So again, I just want to move you towards products more that would have a caution. So an example I like to use is cleanser. So if I ate some cleanser, would it kill me? You might wish you were dead. Yeah, I, I, might have, I might have a stomach ache, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't kill me, right? And I'm not planning to sit down and eat cleanser. But it's calcium carbonate, right? So also things like lemon juice and vinegar, baking soda, things you literally could consume are going to be easier for the septic system to be. So looking at how much water do we use? So we size systems at 150 gallons per de bedroom. That assumes two people per bedroom, which is not most homes, right? So most of our septic systems have a safety factor built into them. The average person, though, does use 50 to 80 gallons a day. You may not believe it, and you'll say, I'm not average, I'm exceptional, and I understand. <laughs> but that is typical. There's a lot of water use out there showing that around 60 gallons. Um, so I just want to say, if you're average, that means you're using 28,000 gallons a year, and a typical household of three is putting out 82,000 gallons of water to your septic system. Think about that area. It's not that big, right? The soil is amazing that it takes that all up and cleans it. So that is the other reason why getting the rainwater away is so important. So the average Minnesota soil, why we get about 40-ish inches of rain a year, this is feet of water. So we can't handle the rain too, and that's why it needs as much as possible to divert away from the septic system. So now look at your lake, right? How many septic systems are around your lake? Depends on your lake, right? Right, so I took 250 homes, and this could be not in your township, around your lake. That's 20 million gallons of wastewater every year that's probably 
either going to groundwater or going into your lake. So it is really important that our septic systems be good, right? So how do we use this water? Most of it is in the bathroom. This was a study that was done in 2016, published in 2016, that showed that the average person does use about 60 gallons a day. Um, you can see it's followed right by laundry. This is the disheartening one, right? 12% of the average water use in a home is due to leaks. And finally, uh, the kitchen. So starting with the toilet, if your bathroom looks like this, it's time for a remodel, right? <laughs> You'll get your money back. The realtors will tell you, right? So this is the number one thing you can do to cut back on water usage in your house is replace five-gallon flush toilets. Some of them even use as much as seven. So recent advancements, right, we're down to 1.3, and I just put a new toilet in my house that has two flushes, right? It actually isn't even on the top. It's on the side. There's a little green lever that actually is 0.7 for urine, right? And then a big flush, which is the 1.3 for things that aren't urine, right? <laughs> this is the other big problem, and this is what I had before, right? The jiggling handle and the seal that we, we tried replacing it. And if you ever don't know, take one drop of food coloring and put it behind, right? What do you call it? It's not the tank. Tank. In the tank and see. Because sometimes it's not the running. We can all hear it when it's running and wide open, but are you having like a slow diffusion of water? Because those all add up over time. So the recommended toilet. <laughs> this is the. I mentioned my Saint Bernard. If he does this, it's a big wet mess. You do not want to die. But that guy got his whole head in. So um, you don't want to use automatic sanitizers. So it still pains me when I see the toilet bowl that's blue. Right? That means every time you flush, you're sending sanitizer down the drain. But they even make ones you put this clear blob. And a lot of our cleaners have are because we are getting lazier and lazier. We don't want to ever have to clean the toilet bowl, so if we constantly sanitize it, there are shower cleaners like this, every spray every time. Those are constantly sanitizing our system. So, for instance, using baking soda or bonami, which is a non-scouring, biodegradable, non-toxic hypoallergenic. You see those sort of things on the label? That actually tells me that it'll be better for the environment to be able to break down naturally. So. Lime and hard water deposits can sometimes be removed with uh, white hot vinegar. So what should go down the toilet bowl? Really any kind of toilet paper. And the key thing about toilet paper is it needs to break down. Your septic tank does not catch all the toilet paper. If it did, it would just be a mass of toilet paper. And if you ever want to know if your toilet paper is good, you put it in a quart jar and shake it. That's what kind of happens when you flush. It starts breaking down. We actually did a test for MnDOT with all the rest areas testing different toilet papers. They all break down. That's what we found. Even the Shulk Charmin Ultra Plush breaks down. So the key thing is none of this stuff, particularly unused medicine, it used to be very common to advise people if they had medicine that were unused to flush them. Even in hospital settings, you never, never want to do that. Septic safe. There's kitty litter that says it's septic safe. And there was one review on Amazon that said it was fine until I got the second cat. And then I plugged up my toilet. Right? <laughs> Usually it means they'll flush. So that term flushable wipe has actually had a lot of litigation around it. Because flushable, it, it's been problems for municipalities. There was a picture on the, on the cover of New York Times that showed a guy standing by a ball of wipes that was taller than him. It was disgusting. So bathing, you want to fix leaks. Use low flow fixtures whenever practical. Although if you have five shower heads and they're all putting out two gallons a minute, it's still 10 gallons per minute. So you want to avoid those daily showers. Avoid antibacterial soaps. Um, liquid soaps you use a lot more. And I know that's very common that most of us have liquid soaps. But if you don't mind using bar soap, you just simply get your hands as clean, but you use a lot less soap to do it. So when it comes to antibacterial soaps, this is soaps where we've added an antibacterial agent, and according to the American Medical Association, they are no more effective. And the good news is Minnesota banned them. So the big uh, culprit for this was triclosan, which was found to convert to dioxin, which is our carcinogen. So we're using a liquid hand soap to sanitize us that can cause cancer later. So it is being phased out. It's still out there a little bit. but And the risk is, is it can affect the good microbes. So when it comes to drains, whenever possible, so if you were bathing your three long-haired dogs, you should have a really good catch basin to catch as much of it as possible. 
None of those things are perfect, but at least if you're catching more of it there. When a drain does plug, it's usually below the sink. And there is research out there showing one dose of a typical amount that someone would use to clear a drain of something like Drano, that's what the study was done on, completely killed off the bacteria in the tank. They come back, right? You don't kill them off forever. Once that Drano kind of passes out to your soil with all the junk with it, right? The tank my microbes will come back. But a lot of those drain cleaners are pretty nasty chemicals. So there are DIY solutions for almost everything. And using a snake to clean the line <coughs> is better, right? Clear the obstruction versus using a chemical. What do you think about sink graders? Oh, garbage disposals? Oh, no. Yeah, I have a slide. Just one sec. <laughs> and I know it's seven, so I'm going to keep talking. You guys have had a lot of questions, which are great. So I won't be offended if anyone needs to leave. So laundry, if you can, if you're getting a new washing machine, install a front-loading washing machine. They use 65% less water. And they actually, in the long run, pay for themselves because they get your clothes drier. And if you have a front loader, they have no agitator, so you don't create as much lint. So they're bad, they're, they're e they, they mark it, they're easier on your clothes. I'm just thinking less lint, too, is a good thing. So spreading out your loads. Here's the lint filter. So it's called the septic protector, and it's actually was developed in Minnesota. It's a Minnesota company that's actually selling it. I don't work for them, so you can buy as many as you want. I don't get a kickback or anything. So. so it's a canister that you put on your discharge line, and it does need to be cleaned, right? So, but typically for most homes, it's a once a week. You can try this. I don't think you'll last long. That's a once a load, mm -hmm. right? I sold one to a lady one time, and she we put it in and Don't tell me she said, put it down there. She, oh yeah, she, she claimed that she said, oh, it catches all kinds of lint. I'm changing it two, or twice a week. And, and I just flush it down the toilet. <laughs> 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 well, at least it was in a big clump. I mean, that's like, did you, did you see clumps? You kind of got her on the right track. Yeah, <laughs> you definitely don't want to put it in the <laughs> So I mentioned this. This is if you send a lot of water at one time, you can stir up the tank. So as far as laundry soap, you want to limit your bleach. Use the minimal amount of detergent. When they send you, I just bought one that was like super concentrated. It had a giant cap and the line of how far you needed to fill it was at the bottom. They just trust most people, they're going to dump it in, right? And they want to sell you the most soap they can. So I usually say start with half of what they recommend and see if your clothes get clean, particularly if you have a water softener. So you have to be careful with powdered soap. Some contain clay, and we don't want clay can plug up your drain field. Do not use, and the key word I need to put in front of you is liquid fabric softeners. So liquid fabric softeners are petroleum-based products that have been found to be emulsifiers. They may not let your tank naturally stratify. So. Um, the recommendation, one, if you have to use them, you could use the dryer sheets are better. But do understand that when your clothes feel soft from a dryer sheet, the ones the most that we buy, it's coating your clothing with a layer of petroleum. Oh. And just decide if you want that on your largest organ of your body, which is your skin. <laughs> so um, you can add a half a cup of baking soda or vinegar, dryer balls. They're a little loud, but um, aluminum foil ball is an anti-static agent. So if you have really static so a few things about the kitchen. We're going to talk about the garbage disposal. The number one thing, no phosphorus in your detergent. And fats and oils should not be going down the drain. Right? They need to be put into the coffee can. They need to go out with your solid waste, not down the drain. They'll pug up your plumbing. Yep. I'm sorry. Back to the laundry. Do you have a feeling about the um, laundry detergent pods? They, the pods do not let you regulate how much you use. So I don't, don't eat them. Yes, I agree. That's a whole different thing. So that's the only reason I don't like them. Um, I also think, I mean, they're making money on the convenience, but that's, that's kind of aside from the septic. But that's why I tell people is you have no way based on the load, based on how much soap you need to control it. I know they're super convenient. I, I get why people use them, but they wouldn't be my first choice. I had someone tell me, a maintainer, this is totally anecdotal, that, that stuff around the outside, he's not convinced it's all dissolving, which I kind of find hard to believe, to be honest with you, because, yeah, no, no. Nope. Especially if you use really cold water right out of the well. Yeah. Not 
So cold water or the well, they're not. So that would be my only concern. So I, I don't use them. So um, is that if it doesn't dissolve and that's getting out there, that will be a problem. No, no, it, it, it sticks to your clothes in the dryer and then you cannot get it off. <laughs> <laughs> yep, comment. Um, do you have any um, advice on boxing? Is that like a bleach or is that? I'd actually, I looked into it before, but now I'd have to look at the label. So if it says that it has peroxide or bleach in it, I, I can't remember specifically. And I don't know if it's in this slide set. If you have this sheet on the back, that website I was talking about where you can find natural products, the Environmental Working Group, I'd be curious if they rate it as well. Um, and the Hazardous Waste Collection site is on this list too, So, which I think I have a slide about coming up. I would read about the pods that the detergent companies are actually losing money because people are using less detergent than if you buy the liquid. It's hogwash. So Do you believe they're losing money? <laughs> I don't believe they're losing money, but I think they're not in business to lose money. So the garbage disposal and the problem with garbage disposals is one, when I eat broccoli, when it comes out of me, it doesn't look like broccoli, right? So I digest it. Then it goes to the septic tank, which has simpler, like kind of amino acids and proteins, right? I've broken it down to things I don't need. So that is the first problem is I'm adding food that's undigested and more of it. Um, it's, and the other problem is, is it chops it into tiny little pieces. And tiny little pieces don't sell out as well as big pieces. So I'm not a fan of them. So the recommendation is if you don't have one, don't, don't install one. Um, and if you have one, use it as little as possible. Uh, so what's required in Minnesota also if you do have one is you have to actually put in a bigger septic tank. And it has to have a wall in it because we're worried that you're putting more solids down and we want to provide for more detention time. So that being said, if you have one and you use it minimally, and you don't have big high flows, you're probably not damaging your septic system because we do put in that extra capacity. And I know some people just have to have one. Like, and it is default. If you are doing a new home or a remodel, they just assume you want one because everybody needs one, right? There is one that's marketed that puts some sort of enzyme in that's supposed to help. And I don't, there's no research, that's what I find. Coffee grounds? No coffee grounds. No, if you can't eat it, don't put it down your septic system. Orange rinds, like all the stuff that, like literally, if you, I mean, okay, and I'm not saying you couldn't eat it because it's gross. I'm saying literally you couldn't digest it. It's going to be very hard for your septic system. Things that are hard in your compost pile, right, that take forever to break down are going to be much harder on your septic system. So other sources of water that shouldn't go to the septic system, if you have a sump pump or tile line discharge, that is probably the worst. That can be hundreds or thousands of gallons when it rains. We'll talk about this one coming up on my next slide again. Water softeners, iron filters, or any other water treatment. So Craig talked about reverse osmosis. Most people's reverse osmosis is just under their sink. But just keep in mind, for every gallon of clean drinking water you make with reverse osmosis, you make on average three gallons of wastewater. So if you're doing it under your sink, I'm not worried about that for your septic system because how much drinking water do you use every day? A gallon or two, right? But there are actually entire home reverse osmosis systems. They cannot go into your septic system. And why would you have one of those? Because you have too much money, right? Uh, so <laughs> know, so someone put one. Sorry if someone has one of those. Um, someone I heard of someone who put one in because they didn't want their irrigation water to stain their sidewalk. <laughs> Do you know how much, I couldn't even envision how much that, because now you're not even talking about your inside water, you're talking about all your irrigation water outside. And I will come back to the water softener here in a second. So dehumidifier discharge, high efficiency furnace discharge, this is particularly, the only time I've seen this be a problem is people leave for extended periods of time, not using any other water, and that's a little trickle of water in their pipe that can cause freezing issues. So if you had freezing issues, I would ask about your high efficiency furnace, uh, those dripping faucets, right? So the water softener discharge. So I heard reference to fluoride. Fluoride is the most recent pollutant in our state that we are spending more and more attention on. We've all talked about road salt, right? Right? We all know road salt can be bad for our lakes. Well, guess what? 25% of the salt used in this state is from water softeners. 
And, seven, and this is again, and 75% is road salt. So we are 25% of the equation with our water softeners. So the less salt we use, honestly, the better. And someday someone's gonna figure out how to remove hardness without salt, but we don't have that way yet today. When it comes to your septic system, the less salt or chloride in particular that's going out to your septic system, the better. So if you have an old water softener, you should replace it. They are like everything else. The new, more efficient models use less salt and actually pay for themselves in salt savings. Um, the other question to ask is, is your water softener actually set appropriately for your hardness? And have you ever had it serviced? They should be serviced a minimum of every five years. And most people have never had their water softener serviced. Over time, the resin that's in them wears out, needs to be either replaced or you need a new model. So, and when it comes to the septic system, because of the issues that salt isn't great for the bacteria, it is actually better if it be routed out of your system. But it can't run into your lake either. It's not good for the lake at all. There is an aquatic standard that actually kills off things that are important in the lake. So it could go to a separate drain field or rock pit, but keep in mind if it goes to the surface, it will kill vegetation because it's salt. Someone told me it made a great deer lick, right? <laughs> um, and so you can have breathing problems. So it's not like your discharge, it's gonna run you know, on your sump pump. It's gonna run every two, three days year round. So that isn't feasible for a lot of people, particularly because it cannot go into a lake river stream, can't go on your neighbor's property, can't go right over your well. We don't wanna drink all that chloride either. So a couple last things. Can you smell your septic system? You shouldn't, right? So septic systems, and when we do this maintenance, you're gonna notice when you open up a septic tank, it has a beautiful smell. That's the smell of anaerobic digestion. So you smell in particular a little bit of methane, a little hydrogen sulfide, but it does not build up in that tank. So if it did, it might explode, right? It is designed that those gases vent back through your plumbing. So you may, on the right day when the wind's blowing, you could have those septic gases blow into your property. So when people do smell their septic system, my first recommendation usually is, are they in a valley, right? Do you have trees that kind of block? Is sometimes extending it alone will kind of help deal with the issue. You can put a charcoal or carbon filter on the stack, because most people notice it on a nice humid day when they're out on their deck. The problem is, come winter, those collect condensation, they freeze, and now you don't have septic odors in your yard have them in your house, which is way less pleasant. So if you have odors inside your home, it's usually not a septic issue, it's usually an issue with your plumbing. That some way or another, those gases aren't getting back up through your plumbing stack. So it could be that you have a frozen vent, or if you have a trap that dries out, let's say you have a shower you never use, and all the water dried out from it, now the gases, because there's no water barrier, have a way to get back up. Do you have any sort of sump? Um, sewage, so sometimes people will have a pump in their basement that's pumping sewage from the, the lower level up. Those can sometimes leak, so just kind of trying to figure out where it's coming from. So you should have all gotten one of these tonight. It is great bedtime reading. <laughs> so finally, what can you do to help protect our water? And this picture is probably a little far away from all of us but it's really showing how our septic systems, our rivers, our lakes, our wastewater treatment, all of it's connected. So the products you're using, the things you're doing in your home, your septic system, your well, um, are all connected. So certainly conserving water is better for everybody. The less water we're using, because again, just remembering that we're recycling it all. Properly operate and maintain your septic system and well. Properly disposed of unused pharmaceuticals and hazardous waste. Again, all counties have hazardous waste collection sites. It's very common now that law enforcement offices are now taking pharmaceuticals back. Again, they, many of them are controlled substances, so it's not as easy as just dropping them off somewhere. So I've seen a lot of them that kind of look like mailboxes, right? You can open them up, but you can't take anything out. And the last thing is, you're all here, so you're already part of this. But what about all the people who aren't here? So how do we get more people to understand the connection between our septic systems, our drinking water, and our lakes? We all have to keep thinking about and trying to get people more excited about. So, 
So lots of websites, and again, these are all on that fact sheet. EPA and both Minnesota have a great, more information about chemicals and emerging concern. And the last thing I'll put out, if you uh, don't get the chance to talk to Craig or I tonight, we're happy to answer emails and phone calls down the road about pretty much anything that relates to what we talked about tonight. Um, the other thing I really do uh, want to thank um, the organization for finding this and that we're, we are lucky enough to have a pump truck here tonight. So if you want to observe a tank cleaning, you guys are still up for it, right? Oh, no. oh I'm talking about them because the weather, they're like, as long as it's not pouring, we'd be happy. Yeah. When do you, when do you want to do that? Well, I, I do have a few things to say. Well, I'd like to see if there's any questions real quick before we head out. What's going on So I'm not the answer. So, yeah, so the question is about microbeads. Um, microbeads were actually banned. So they can't put microbeads in any So those are they were particularly things where it's a lot of things. So, yeah, so it's, microbeads are now gone out of any new product. But there's still lots of microplastics, unfortunately, which is all that when we're talking about synthetic fibers and things along those lines. We did that in the plan of 2013-14. And it seemed to me that the slope between the, the last tank to the leaf field actually sloped up so the water drained back in, in, into the into the tank after the pump gets the the going. Is that the it's correct? always so unless it's not feasible, but 99% of the time when your pump shuts off, we want to make sure that pump line drains. And the easiest way to do that is to have it drain back to the pump. So that is how they are almost all designed. It's how they should be. We never want standing water in a pipe. Do you have standing water in a pipe in Minnesota? Yeah. It will freeze. Well, I think yeah. we have, since we did it so much, they did a lot of backfilling in there. I think we must have a whole spot that we have to fix. You might. So, yep. You can get a sag on that pipe and a dip. It'll freeze you. Sooner or later, those will get back. <laughs> All right, well, I think he's, he, I saw them head out. They probably have a few things to do to get situated. So if you have other questions or want to talk, we'll, we'll stick around up here for a little bit. The other thing I think that said something about Skyrim, how? probably about to here. This is probably a thousand gallon tank, but the pump keeps that level lower. It's, if you look in here, you don't have to stand behind the fence <laughs> to come and look. The pump keeps this level quite a bit lower. And so the a half F or a third. It goes over there, naturally. All of the wastewater from the building comes into this tank first. Yeah. It has to fill to an operating level, which is approximately three and a half feet. It varies from tank to tank, but it, once it fills to that level, every gallon of water that's used from that point on, a gallon is displaced into this side. The idea is the solids are held back in the first tank through that stratification or settling process. So the, the heavy solids are on the bottom, the sludge. This one doesn't have much crust on it. If you look, you can see there's just a very slight crust, and then the rest is liquid. And most of that, if you were to sample it, is reasonably clear. But as it goes into the lift tank, then it's clear but not clean. 
So this is just a delivery method out to, I'm not exactly sure, the, the pipe is headed off in this direction. So I'm assuming it's in this area here. Right. And it doesn't look as though they've identified it because this is a public space. They probably didn't want to put the caps you know, where they could get damaged. So the solids stay in that tank and the liquids transfer out into the drain field here for treatment. How do you know where to, is one of these got the screen in it? Or the... Well, we're going to look. This, if it has a screen, This one isn't that way. Every tank is a little bit different. Sometimes you get down heavier there. solids on the bottom. We'll see that as we go down. The way I try and measure it is with the hose. You'll see a distinct difference between the liquid and the sludge layer on the bottom. And when I start to see sludge, then I will check with the hose and measure it in that regard. And in most cases, I'm, I'm usually measuring 8 to 12 inches of sludge on the bottom. Essentially a clear hollow tube that they can go through yeah. and yeah. pull a profile sample. Some, of the, some kid or somebody don't get in there and gotta take everything. Yeah. Ours is originally screwed screw from the side. said your operating level is approximately 45 inches. So if you have 10 to 12 inches between the top layer and the bottom layer, total, you're at or above 25%. And some, you don't know until you see what's on the bottom. So you pump it up. In most cases, I've been doing this for 20 years, in most cases, if you've gone three years, you'll have at least 25% of solids. Unless it's really scary. Well, I guess we, we just need that now and we got five bedrooms that three of them are only used for a couple of weeks in the summer by right. the day. But so a house is probably still set up for new maximum, so we're, we're set up for system that. System sizing is based on the number of bedrooms. There's up to three bedrooms, the board requires at least a thousand gallon tank. You can go larger, but that has to be the minimum size. Five bedroom house requires a 1500 gallon tank. This one, just looking at it, I'm guessing is a 2000 gallon tank. I'll be able to tell when I'm done. I have the measurement on the truck how many gallons. Oh, I know. We'll have to count it on a hell of a It's a great big tank. Yeah, well, and like I said, from right here, this, this will be the edge of the tank. And for this pipe here, there's the back end. Incidentally, this tank does not have a screen in it. That's why we take a look inside the tank. And you can look in here, you can see the baffle that you talked about, the square piece that goes around the pipe. Is it, is it not in cold then? Lift tank down with a square piece. Yes, there's a baffle on the inlet, the outlet, and the inlet to this tank. Is that a 
something weird about having the screen would actually drop straight down. I agree. Probably look at it. weird about having the devil bed next to the I'd say so. <laughs> oh, for real. <laughs> it's really exciting. You're going to watch it again when it airs on the TV. Right? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.